Hey everyone, today we're going to be looking at a survey of Islam. Islam is one of those Abrahamic uh, monotheistic religions that we have discussed so far in our lecture. And as I said, we're going to always start with some kind of basic facts about the religion itself. And so really quickly, if I was going to ask you a definition for the word Islam, uh, I think a good definition would be that Islam is an Abrahamic monotheistic religion that is centered primarily around the teachings and revelations from the Quran, a religious text considered by Muslims to be the direct word of God, whom they call Allah, as it was revealed to the prophet Muhammad. And they also centered around the traditions of the Hadith, which is considered the backbone of Islamic civilization. Followers of Islam are known as Muslims, which come from the Arabic uh, participle of the word Islam itself, and it means one who belongs to Islam. So Muslim is this uh, direct correlation to the word Islam. Now, I want to make a quick note here that prior to the 20th century, if you look back in historical texts, uh, it was very common for you to see the word Muslim spelled in English as either M-O-S-L-E-M or Masulam, M-U-S-S-A-L-E-M. And it was mainly due to phonetic spellings. So again, like I said, if you go back to old historical textbooks, um, sometimes if you see old quotes from religious scholars or historians, you'll see a different spelling and pronunciation of Muslim. But more, more or less today, it's been codified as just what you see here on the screen. Now, uh, also, I want to make you aware of terms used to be described by Muslims. So sometimes you will see again in a lot of ancient texts, sometimes you'll see this as well in other languages that they'll call Muslims Muhammadans, Muhammadans named after the Prophet Muhammad, those who follow the Prophet Muhammad. Or sometimes you'll see in certain uh, languages, particularly like Italian, French, um, still today, uh, or uh, again, just texts from long ago, you'll see the word Saracens, Saracens being S-A-R-A-C-E-N-S, Saracens, which referred to a kingdom uh, uh, that comprised of modern day um, Iraq, Syria, modern day Jordan, parts of Persia, well, well modern day Iran. So uh, sometimes you'll see those two terms. Uh, however, I want to stress here that the term Muhammadan is very offensive to Muslims and is a bit of a misnomer as Islam worships one deity alone. And that being Allah, not, it doesn't venerate the prophet Muhammad in the same vein that Christians venerate Christ. So again, it's not fair and it's not right to call Muslims Muhammadans. Uh, the majority of Muslims would consider the name Muhammadan as uh, the term shriek, uh, shriek in Islam, shriek, S-H-I, uh, R-K, Shri. Uh, basically, that means the sin of idolatry. So that's a very big no-no within Islam. So again, be cautious. Don't call them Mohammedans. Um, like I said, the term Saracens, um, that was uh, very popular among Greco-Roman cultures because of the kingdom of Sarasa. Or uh, European Crusaders would refer to all Muslims as Saracens. Um, again, that's a bit of a misnomer because not all Muslims are Arabs. And not all Arabs are Muslims. Uh, so, in fact, the majority of Muslims are non-Arabs. In fact, only around 20%, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit of less, of the entire Muslim population is in fact Arab. And 12% of all Muslims in the entire world live in just one country, which is non-Arab, Indonesia. It's non-Arab, it's in the Southeast Asia. It's an Asian uh, 
Pacific Island type country. So again, it's very much a misnomer to talk about Muslims as Mohammedans or Saracens, or even to say that all Muslims are Arab. No, incorrect. The word, uh, the Arabic word Islam means one who surrenders or one who submits themselves to God, which explains how Muslims see their relationship to God as well as their religious traditions. It's one of submission, not so much as submission as slavery, but think of it as surrendering your will, surrendering over your selfish desires to follow somebody else's, similar to a marriage relationship or into a just a normal relationship with uh, uh, someone of the opposite sex or someone of the same sex or who you're interested in. It involves a little bit of surrender, a surrender of your pride, a surrender of sometimes your desires to do things that your loved one would rather do. And so think of submission, Islam, not in this negative connotation as pure slavery to God, but rather as a surrendering of the will. Islam is the world's second largest religion, just only behind Christianity, uh, and its followers range anywhere from uh, 1.8 billion to around 2 billion globally. So one way to think about it is to say that around a quarter of the world's total population so the world is around seven, over seven billion people. So just a quarter of that, around 23.4% as of 2020 is Muslim. And due to the high fertility rate among Muslims, especially in Indonesia, especially in India, especially in Africa, Islam is the world's fastest growing major religion. And according to some projections, it is projected to be the largest religion by the end of the 21st century, surpassing Christianity. However, Christianity uh, is still a very growing religion in Latin America and in Africa because of population rates as well. But still, that's the projection that's going on sometime in the 21st century. Like Christianity, uh, Islam is a truly a world religion or a global religion and that Muslims populations are represented on every continent in the globe. Out of the 195 officially recognized countries by the United Nation, around 50 of those countries are majority Muslim. And like Christianity, Islam is not an ethno religion, but is classified as a missionary religion or a proselytizing religion meaning that people convert to uh, that people convert to the religion rather than being born into it or that their ethnicity is ex is not exclusively tied to the religion so that means again not all muslims are arabs and not all arabs are muslim and like christianity Islam can be classified as a founder religion, meaning that the religion is largely shaped and defined by its founder, the prophet Muhammad. But unlike Christianity and to some extent, Sikhism, Buddhism, that we've already discussed in this class, uh, the prophet Muhammad is not worshiped nor prayed to in this religious tradition. Instead, the prophet of Muhammad is venerated, but it's more like respected, regarded with great respect and great reverence. But again, I must stress, the prophet is not worshipped. It's not like Buddhism, that the Buddha is somewhat venerated and sometimes meditated upon. There's no such things like that in Islam. The prophet is not venerated in the same manner as Roman Catholics or Orthodox Christians venerate the saints or the Virgin Mary. 
Rather, the prophet is respected and venerated in the same way that Mormons venerate their religious founder, Joseph Smith. And it's an interesting fact, side note here, that early in the United States history, Mormons were routinely called Muhammadans because of the unique parallelisms that existed between Islam as a religion, what it claims to be about, uh, how it was founded, and how it treated its founder, very strong parallelisms with that of Islam. And so again, lots of people in the United States, as a uh, what you know, when they first encountered Mormonism, thought of it in the same vein, or was somewhat confused with as a form of Islam. And like many of the world, uh, well, let me rephrase that. Unlike many of the world religions that we have discussed outside of Sikhism. Uh, Islam is a relatively young religion, only emerging in the, on the world stage from the seventh century CE, this late, you know, the mid 600s, did it emerge onto the world stage. So what this means for historians and for religious scholars is that we have greater access to knowledge about the origins of the religion, its very beginnings as opposed to other world religions like Hinduism, where we really don't know enough because it's so old and that we have to rely on religious texts or like Zoroastrianism that we talked about, that we don't know its origins because we have to rely on religious texts and their claims about the origins of the religion. Islam's not like that. Islam's more like Sikhism. And so thus scholars and historians can speak with greater accuracy and certainty about the religion, its development, its influences, and its growth, because we know a lot more. We have a lot more written texts, and we have a lot more contemporary written texts, as opposed to even Christianity. We know a lot about Christianity, but we don't have contemporary non-religious uh, bias traditions about Jesus and the origins of the church. We have a few, but it's, you know, at least at minimum, a hundred years later, if not 50 years later. For Islam, we have direct contemporary evidences of Christians and Byzantine uh, Roman historians writing about Islam. And it's quite accurate what we know and what we see. So I just wanted to stress that point here. So now we've laid the ground uh, level for the basics of Islam. We have this ground uh, foundation fully established. Again, we start with the founder. Uh, that is the founder religion. So we got to start with the founder. And so we need to talk about who was the prophet Muhammad. So first, before we can talk about the prophet, is it important for me to mention uh, some more characteristics about his veneration within the culture and religion of Islam? So in Islam, when the name of the prophet is spoken or when it is written, traditionally Muslims will immediately say after his name an Arabic phrase. Aliyah ah, or yeah, asa salam. Aliyah as salam, which means peace be upon him. And so, a lot of times, um, either people will try to avoid saying his name, or any time that they say his name, that is immediately said. Now, however, I do need to note here: I am not a Muslim, but I do respect the personhood of Muhammad and I do respect the religion of Islam. So for my purposes, I'm going to say the prophet a lot of times, but I'm not going to say the Arabic phrase behind him. It's not because I don't respect Muhammad. Uh, it's mainly just because I'm not a Muslim. So it's not a part of my tradition. It's not a part of my culture, but I do have respect for him. So I'll avoid saying his name, but I will instead call him the prophet out of respect. Um, 
And this is very similar levels of relevance that also apply to Allah. Um, that again, people will have that sometimes about Ali that we'll talk about later. But this is very similar to what we would also see in Judaism. The Judaism have the same level of reverence for the name of God. Um, also, I want to point out here this image. So this image here, this is from a manuscript uh, that comes from, from us from Persia about the prophet being uh, visited by the angel Gabriel. And so there's something very important that you will notice about this image in that the face of the prophet is whited out. And so originally it is believed by historians and art historians that the face of Muhammad the prophet actually appeared on many of these manuscripts because we actually have other manuscripts from non-Arab uh, non uh, traditions and cultures, uh, particularly from China, far, um, sometimes in India, um, that you will have the face of the prophet still visible and not whited out. And so scholars believe that it was a, a later thing that happened as a sign of reverence. So a lot of times you'll see the prophet in certain manuscripts, traditions, having this fiery glow around him to signify um, that he was divinely inspired and that he was quite an extraordinary person. But you will also see his face blotted out, again, as a sign of reverence. The, the prophet is not to be depicted. So, um, so even in my artwork here that I do show, because I want you to see some of the shows, uh, you'll probably see the prophet that has his face whited out. So again, I just want to make that clear. So the prophet was born approximately around 570 CE. We don't know exactly the dates, but we do know around a certain time and that he was born in the modern day city of Mecca which is in the Arabian Peninsula, modern day Saudi Arabia, that's on the, uh, if I remember my geography, on the western side, the west coast side, there's a mountain range that goes along the western side of the Arab Arabian Peninsula that's closest to Africa. So, uh, Mecca is closest to the African side of the peninsula, so modern day Saudi Arabia. Uh, he was the son of Abdul, uh, Abdullah ibn Ab al Mutalib. And Muhammad's father was the son of the leader of the uh, Banu, uh, uh, yes, the Banu Hashim clan of the Qurashi tribe. And so that's a very important tribe that is very important within the Quran. If you read the Quran, you'll see that tribe mentioned a long time. It was that tribe who was very important. The Qurashi tribe historically inhabited and controlled the city of Mecca. It was an important city in the Arabian Peninsula because it housed not only the religious site, the Kaaba, which pre-existed Muhammad, but also it was an important trading center between Saudi Arabia uh, and Africa. Prior to Islam, the city of Mecca, like I said, was this trading place, but also this pilgrimage. And prior to Islam, the Kaaba was believed to be a shrine that housed many of the pagan deities of the pre-Islamic period. Uh, so it housed the pre-Islamic Arab religions. And so we know we know very little about the, the religions of the Arab people prior to Islam uh, but there are evidences from certain hadiths, from certain stories, from certain passages within the Quran itself, as well as some ex, uh, contemporary uh, sources from Egypt and Byzantine Christianity. Uh, and so what we can gather is that it was very much um, similar to the types of religion experience that was going on in the day that uh, the primary god that the the, the Arabs worshipped before um, Islam was Hubal, Hubal, H-U-B-A-L, and the goddess Al-Lat, and the father deity of the entire Arab pantheon 
was named Allah. And so the, uh, if you look at it, it structures very similar to what we know of other Semitic religions in the regions. The Arab people are a Semitic people, just like the Jews, just like those in Babylon, and in and, uh, the ancient city of Ugarit and the Canaanites. And so their deities look very similar, have similar functionalities as those of other Semitic people. So um, it was very common, a very common, I guess, religion. Uh, uh, the prophet's early life was filled with a great tragedy, according to Arab uh, uh, Islamic traditions. Uh, the prophet's father died just a few months before his birth, or a few months after his, no, yeah, just a few months before his birth, that's right. And then after his birth, when I think when uh, the prophet was around six years old, uh, is when his mother died, forcing him to become an orphan. Uh, it, the, according to uh, Islamic traditions, he was passed around from family member to family member for about two years until about the age of eight when he came under the protection and care of his uncle, Ab Abu Talib, who was the new leader of the Banu Hashim clan of the Qurashi tribe. Uh, and so his uncle, Abu, was very, very, very important figure in Mecca and within the tribe. Uh, according to traditions, uh, uh, during the prophet's teenage years, he was he accompanied his uncle on various travel journeys throughout the Levant. So that includes the cities of Jerusalem, Antioch, Damascus, these great centers of the old Middle East and gained experience uh, in commercial trade. However, similar to Jesus, there's little that is known about the prophet during his youth. Uh, there's some fragmental stories uh, that he, you know, continued to follow in his uncle's footsteps as a merchant that he possibly had traveled even throughout the Mediterranean Sea, maybe had even traveled across the Indian Ocean. Uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, but however, every single story emphasized one major thing about the prophet that he was very faithful person and that he was a very trustworthy person. He had a very positive reputation. And because of that, according to traditions, he eventually became an arbiter, sort of like a judge, um, but on a lesser, lesser scale, not so much legals, but kind of a lawyer that handled out contracts for various businesses. Uh, and that's was kind of what he did, like a small claims court. That would be the, the relevant today. But however, his life kind of changed around the year uh, 595 uh, CE. And what we do know at that time is that he was hired by a very successful businesswoman in Mecca, um, Khadija, uh, who uh, represented a very large trade caravan and was conducting transactions between uh, Mecca and places in Syria. Uh, and uh, Khadija was probably around 40 years old and it was believed that the prophet was around 25 when they first met. Um, but they fell in love very quickly and they actually married each other. And by all accounts, this marriage was a very happy one and that all Muslims celebrate this union. In fact, in many Muslim and Arab, uh, uh, Islamic traditions, the story in the relationship of the prophet and his first wife, Khadija, is a, an example, an example for Arabs to follow and Muslims to follow. And so it's a very much celebrated re, uh, relationship. However, um, everything changed for his life in the year 610 CE. And what we know according to traditions is that prior to this time, the prophet began to travel for several weeks every year to a local mountain that was near Mecca known as Jabal al-Nur. Uh, this mountain was very near Mecca and he would go there a lot to pray alone, to meditate alone and contemplate alone. And it was during this time the Islamic traditions hold that the prophet was visited by the angel 
Gabriel. This is the same angel that appears to uh, the Virgin Mary in the gospel stories and pre presents himself to Joseph, the father of Jesus. So this is the same Gabriel and other er uh, Abrahamic traditions. This is the same Abraham who appeared before the prophet Daniel in the Daniel uh, uh, when Daniel was in the lion's den within Judaism. And so at this point, this is a good reminder that Islam sees itself as not being only a only a part of the same er, uh, Abrahamic traditions that of Judaism and Christianity. But Islam sees itself as a restoration and a fulfillment of the Abrahamic traditions. The same claims that Christianity would make and the same claims that Mormonism would make as well. So again, those parallels. But according to Islamic tradition, uh, the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and proclaimed to him one single word. Read. But Muhammad responded to him and said, I can't read. And so that's very interesting about the person of the prophet. The, the Quran and Islamic traditions will all say that the prophet wasn't a dumb, was not a dumb person. No, quite contrary. He was a very smart person, but he just did not know how to read, which spoke very, that was something very common in that period of time that not everybody read, maybe about 15%, maybe 20% of the world's population could read a writing, but it didn't mean that they were dumb, illiterate. But the prophet exclaims, I can't read. And so according to tradition, then Gabriel embraced him and commanded him to recite. And what Muhammad would come to recite would eventually be the Quran, which is this, what, what the Quran means, the same word, recite. And the Quran is the most sacred scriptures within the Islamic religion. And it was understood that the, the words of that these words that appear in the Quran were in fact spoken by Gabriel. And Gabriel was the messenger of Allah. So these are the words of Allah. These are the words of God, but through the angel Gabriel and through the prophet. So the prophet was, upon seeing the angel Gabriel, uh, was very, very distressed and quite worried. Because uh, he was all alone on this mountain. So who is going to believe him when he comes down from a mountain and says, hey guys, guess what? An angel just came and visited me and, and told me to say a bunch of words to you. People are going to think he's crazy. Everybody would dismiss him because uh, he was alone. He went loco up on the mountain. And so after his experience in the cave, uh, the prophet returned home to his wife uh, and stated the terror that he was in and the fear that he was and even pleaded for her to cover him up with a blanket uh, and not to have his face shown because he didn't know what to do. He knew he had this great responsibility to speak. But again, who was going to believe him? But his wife calmed him down like a good a spouse does to an outrate spouse. They calm him down. And the prophet described the encounterment to Kharija, and she believed him. She believed he was telling the truth. And so within Islamic traditions, Kharija is actually considered the first person in the world to convert to Islam because she believed her husband without a doubt and accepted what is known in Islam as al khakha the truth. According to Islamic traditions, Khadija took her husband to see her cousin, her cousin who was, happens to be a Christian priest, well, a Christian monk. Uh, and he was a very respected holy man. His name was uh, Wa Raqqa Ibn Nafal. And he 
the her cousin listened. Her cousin listened to the prophet and to his experiences, and determined that, in truth, his experiences were real, and it did have some significance and did have some meaning. Now, within Islamic tradition, uh, Warhika, uh identified uh, was identified as a uh, a non-Muslim atheist, or a uh, they would use the term uh, uh, a patriarch of Abraham. Um, and this term uh, Hanif was used for a lot of people uh, that were Christians who did not believe in the Trinity. They were non-Trinitarian Christians. And so what we can gather from it is that uh, War, um, that Warakwa was a Nestorian Christian. He was a monophyte. And so some of the debates and the influences that we talked about within Christianity bleed into Islam and bleed into the Arabian Peninsula. That's just a side note. But anyhow, again, Waraka responded to the prophet's claims as genuine experiences and saw this as a parallelism that he sees in other prophets throughout the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible. He also saw that this angel that spoke to Muhammad was the same angel that appeared throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And therefore, Warakar believed that all of these experiences and parallelisms were indicators that the prophet's experiences was legitimate. And it was reported that he said, Quote, surely he, Muhammad that is, is the prophet of his people, the Arabs. And so a lot of Christians, kind of a side note here, a lot of Christians in the time that Islam appeared saw the prophet Muhammad in that light, that he is a prophet who is called to the Arab people, similar to as Moses was called as a prophet to the Israelites were and Christians would say Jesus was called as a prophet and Paul was called called a prophet to the world. So according to Islamic traditions, Muhammad did not begin his public ministry for several years. In fact, it took him about three years to work up the nerve and the courage to start his public preaching ministry in the city of Mecca. And when he started preaching, most Meccans uh, ignored him or just downright mocked him. Uh, but however, a few became his followers. Uh, there were three main groups who converted to Islam uh, very early. Uh, the first were younger brothers and sisters of many of the great merchants in the city of Mecca. Others were people who had fallen out of rank within the tribe, who were pushed out, who had kind of a failed status within the community and were pushed out to the extremes. They saw a chance and were hooked into Islam as this is a new start in a new community. And third group were a lot of foreign migrants who were migrated to the community. According to some, possibly some Christians, some Jews had converted to Islam as well because they saw it as a continuation. However, the real opposition in Mecca started when uh, the prophet began to recite verses from the angel Gabriel that condemned idol worship and the practice of polytheism of the Meccan forefathers. That was the bread and butter of Mecca. Mecca was this religious hub which people would come and pilgrimage to these holy sites of the pre-Islamic Arab religions. And so Muhammad was starting to preach strongly against them. And so his followers increased, but the prophet soon became a threat to tribe leaders and city rulers whose wealth rested on the pilgrimage to the Kaaba, the focal point of religious life in Mecca and in the area of peninsula. So the prophet, again, was a huge threat. The prophet denounced 
much of the Mekian traditional religion as offensive to the own tribes. That the Karish, he was the guardians who were the guardians of the, of the Kaaba and who were also part of his own family, were quite angry. However, they didn't touch uh, the prophet because Abu Talib, his uncle, his uncle protected him. And so due to the prophet's relationship to his uncle, the Meccans were very unhappy uh, were, and unable to openly mistreat or persecute the prophet. But it was fair game on the community of followers. Very much fair game on the followers. So it was during this time that the first couple of martyrs of Islam had occurred. In fact, uh, one of the martyrs was a woman. The very first was a woman, which speaks to the importance that women played very early on in the initial uh, phase of this religion. But also you will notice a growing trend within other religions, Christianity, Buddhism as well, that it was women who are the first believers of these faiths. So it's quite interesting. Um, however, in around 615 uh, CE, and in response to the growing persecution on the Islamic community, the Prophet had started to encourage his followers to start to migrate to across the Red Sea, uh, across the uh, peninsula, or across to the other side of the continent there to Africa, to migrate to the Ethiopian Christian kingdom of Aksum. Uh, which this kingdom had existed from 100 CE to about 940 CE, uh, and that uh, he had made an arrangement with the local king there, King Ashaham, uh, uh, that they were allowed to establish a small Muslim colony there under the protections of the Christian king there. Uh, according to Islamic tradition, Ashaham actually believed that Muhammad was a prophet from God. Again, and he saw the same thing, citing direct parallels that he saw with the gospel story and with the Virgin Mary and Jesus, and so recognized him as a prophet. Uh, so groups of Muslims started to migrate to Ethiopia and in kind of establishing the first Islamic community outside of Mecca, growing. Uh, and uh, some of the migrants included his own, uh, uh, Muhammad's own daughter, uh, Ru, uh, Ru Kaya, and one of his son-in-laws, Uthman, uh, who would later be one of the third caliphs and successors, and we'll talk about that later. So, uh, so some of the earliest followers, including even parts of his family, did go to Ethiopia. Uh, and this community would stay there until uh, uh, 622 uh, BCE, where then a, a large majority of them did leave to come back to Arabia once um, the prophet secured their security. However, a few stayed there in Africa. So from 616 to 619, Islamic traditions record that Muhammad began, began to experience extreme levels of depression and sincere doubt due to all the various circumstances that were occurring in his life, uh, and particularly among his followers. Uh, the Karashi clan had declared a public boycott against uh, Muhammad's own family, uh, against his uncle Abu Talib, as well as others, uh, because they would refuse to withdraw their protection from the prophet, uh, and his, you know, his own followers having to flee for safety um, while the prophet stayed behind. Uh, but the final straw was the event of two things, uh, and they both happened in the year six nineteen. His wife died, and his uncle died, Abu Talib. And so this is known in Islamic tradition as the year of sorrow uh, because uh, the prophet loved his first wife. Uh, they had a very strong relationship and you can tell from the stories that she was his rock. But also he lost the protection of his uncle. 
And so his status changed. And so it was believed that during this time that uh, the prophet recited uh, what is known as the problematic verses or what is known as the satanic verses that are found in the Quran. So these verses are found in surah. Uh, surah are chapters in uh, the Quran. So surah uh, 53 uh, verse 19 and 20. Within the Islamic tradition, uh, the explanation is that uh, the prophet is alleged to have mistaken this passage as a divine revelation, but it is preserved. Um, so what this verse appears to do is to offer praise by the prophet to the three main Meccan goddesses of the pre-Islamic Arabian religion, that of Al-Lat, Al-Uzza, and Manat. And so the passage reads this, it's very short, but it reads as, have you thought of Al-Lat and Al-Uzza and about the third deity, Al-Manat? These are the exalted, and the word in Arabic is Gaharanik, Gaharanik, whose intercession is hoped for, end quote. Now this phrase, uh, Gaharanik, is what scholars call, uh, it's a Latin term, hapex legomenon. It's a Latin term. And basically what that means is that this word is only found once. And so we, thus we don't know what its definition because we only have the context of when it's found in a written text. It's only found once. So it means that we're not sure what it means. And we've never seen this word. Uh, so we really don't know what this word, word means. Our best guess and what Arab scholars have talked about as well is that the best guess is that it means either cranes or mothers or a high deity. We're not sure. Uh, very early on in Islamic traditions, the explanation for the satanic passages uh, were attributed to the ongoing struggle and evolution of the prophet. So you would have things like... Um, Al Tabir, uh, uh, Tabir's writings, which are uh, they date from uh, the nine hundreds, that he says that the prophet was quote eager for the welfare of his people, desiring to win them by any means necessary. So this is an explanation for why it appeared was that oh it was a mistake. Uh, others like Ibn Hashim, uh, who's writing in, uh, around the eight hundreds. Uh, records uh, in his preface that he believed that the satanic verses were uh, uh, distress, were a cause of distress, were written in a cause of distress, which I think that's probably true there. Um, but uh, uh, later on, uh, Al Tabiri uh, would say that no, these verses came from interference by Satan himself, and so this is why it's called the satanic verses that. The prophet had heard, was listening to the voice of Gabriel, but then the, Satan had come and, uh, as it said, like, uh, uh, quote, cast upon his tongue. And because uh, the prophet uh, didn't know that this was Satan speaking, he was confused. For me personally, I think it's reflecting back to 619, that the death of his wife, the death of his of his protector, his uncle, that he was all alone. And so I think uh, Eben Hashim's explanation that this was a, the Satan verses indicate great distress in the prophet's life is true. But I just wanted to talk about that. Um, but things changed for him in 620. And so shortly after his experiences here in the year 620, Islamic tradition reports that the prophet experienced a miraculous night journey with the angel Gabriel, known as the Isra and the Mah uh, Miraj. It was said that uh, the prophet had miraculously traveled through the air on the back of a winged horse. Some traditions is a winged donkey named Baruch, uh, um, and that he had traveled in one night from Mecca to, quote, the farthest mosque, which is traditionally recognized as the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. 
or AKA the Dome of the Rock. And so that's why the Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem is extremely important because it is reported that the prophet himself traveled there. And so at Jerusalem, it is said in Islamic traditions that the prophet was tested by God through the angel Gabriel over his faith and his commitment to religious piety. Uh, the tradition says that the, uh, the prophet was tempted by alcohol and he refused uh, instead of participating in drinking, he prayed. But after these testings, tradition says that the prophet was spirited up to heaven by the angel Gabriel, where he encountered Abraham, encountered Moses, encountered John the Baptist, and encountered Jesus himself, the greatest of the Abrahamic prophets of the Abrahamic traditions, and then would later go on to speak with God himself. And according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad learned from God how the Muslims were to pray, and that the prophet then taught the other prophets there in heaven, this is how they are to pray as well, before he was taken back to Mecca. In other Islamic traditions, is this is when the angel Gabriel anoints the prophet in the same vein that the Old Testament prophets and Jesus was anointed as well. So again, to signify his status as a continuation within these other traditions. Therefore, the event of the Isra and the Maraj serves as a kind of final confirmation that Muhammad was God's chosen prophet. And thus it seems to now have given him strength and to propel the prophet forward in his missionary journeys and for the rest of the life. And so it's a huge event, a very celebrated event. And so it was after this event that the prophet began to preach more openly and more forcefully and more boldly after this event, especially during the highest point of the season during the pilgrimage season to Mecca and speaking directly at the Kaaba. And so between 621 and 622, Muhammad actually was beginning a conversation with the city leadership of a rival trade town in the region. This trade town was known as uh, Yathrib, Yathrib, Y-A-T-H-R-I-B, Yathrib. Uh, but this town would later be known as Medina. And it's the second most holiest city within Islam and as well as the second most holy city within the Arabian Peninsula. And he was eventually invited to this city. And according to Islamic traditions, Medina, which is about 280 miles, about that's 400 something kilometers north of Mecca, and was pre previously controlled by predominantly Jewish tribes until it was a rest wrestled away from by Ar uh, Arab tribes who now were fighting each other for dominance. And so the city leaders looked to the prophet because they heard of his reputation and because of his ability to be an impartial arbiter. And so they desired to have him come into the city and to marshal out control of the city between these two warring factions. Um, however, scholars and historians believe that many of the Arabs around the city of Medina had actually, in fact, already converted to uh, this new religion and thus were recognizing the prophet's status and wanted him to come and to rule over Medina and to actually possibly, some scholars and historians argue, to create a rival pilgrimage site in Medina. Because again, Medina was a rival trading city to that of Mecca. We don't know. Regardless of the truth, what we do know is that the prophet agreed to move and it started to encourage his community between 60, uh, 261 to, uh, not 261, sorry, to 621 and 622 that he started uh, encouraging his community of believers to start migrating to the city and those even in Ethiopia to migrate back to Mecca and then to travel with him to Medina. And so on July 16, 622 CE, 
Muhammad and about 70 Islamic families officially migrated the 280 miles north towards Medina. And this event is known within the Islamic tradition as the Hiraj, the Hijra, and which is the starting date of a new Islamic calendar. And so Islamic calendar doesn't go is the same way as the Christian calendar or the Western calendar goes. And so six, the year 622 is in fact year one for Muslims. So you, sometimes you'll see um, like um, 700 and then AH beside it. That's an indication uh, of basically in the year of the Hiraj. So it's also reported that at the same time this is going on, that the leadership of Mecca tried to assassinate the prophet. However, the plan was uncovered by his closest friend, Abu Bark, and his son-in-law, Ali, uh, who are also two of very important figures in the early history of, of, uh, of Islam. Once Muhammad arrived in Medina, among the first things that he did was to ease the long-standing grievances uh, among the tribes in Medina by drafting a constitution, one of the first written preserved constitutions that we have, known as the Constitution of Medina, which was going to dictate how the community was going to be governed, was going to put into writing the rights of individuals and the duties of all citizens. So it's a very much celebrated document that we do still have to this day and why the Prophet Muhammad is considered a very important historical figure because of this document that again points to kind of his, uh, that, that he's not an, uh, an ignorant, illiterate man, but he actually was quite a very smart man. Um, and so this document, again, Constitution of Medina, is very important because it also establishes the first and institutionalizes uh, the city as a multi-religious, multicultural city-state, which was somewhat of an anomaly at the time because it also codified certain rights that minorities are to have and that minority religions were going to have that didn't exist in Roman Christian cultures at the day. So within the Constitution, the prophet creates and uses a specific word to describe all Muslims and to describe the Islamic community, the Ummah, the Ummah, U-M-M-A-H. So that is what is a term that is used for, to describe all Muslims, similar to Sangha in Buddhism, to use to describe of all Buddhists. The church used to describe all Christian communities, that word. So the word Uma means community, and it doesn't refer to a specific group or to a specific people or even to a specific nationality, rather the collective, the entire universal Islamic community, despite one's race, despite one's gender. So all who are Muslim are in fact one people, they are one nation, they are one tribe. So what the prophet was doing was breaking down the old tribal systems that had dominated the Arabian Peninsula and he was creating a new system, a tribalist, class, you know, casteless society. So again, that's another reason why the prophet is celebrated and studied outside religious circles. So as Muslims started to migrate to Medina, the people in Mecca began to start seizing their property because they're traveling um, from Mecca, you know, from Mecca, traveling outside Mecca to Medina. It's a long way, it's a perilous journey. And so the Meccans started to raid these caravans seizing their property by force anyone who was journeying and openly attacking these caravans uh, these actions would eventually lead to an open war between those in Mecca and Medina and it was during this time that Muhammad recites 
the famous Quranic verse from Surah 22 um, that permits Muslims to retaliate against others. Uh, the surah goes, quote, permission to fight back is hereby granted to those being fought, for they have been wronged, and Allah is truly most capable of helping them prevail. They are those who have been expelled from their homes for no other reasons other than proclaiming our Lord is Allah. Had Allah not repelled the aggression of some people by other means, destruction would have surely claimed monastery, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which Allah's name is mentioned. Allah will certainly help those who stand up for him. Allah is truly all-powerful and almighty." End quote. So even though Islam is a religion of peace, when it does speak of violence, it always speaks of violence in the prism of self-defense. And so it's a very much a misnomer to say Islam is a religion of the sword. Instead, Islam is a religion of self-defense, but primarily it is a religion of peace. In March of 624 uh, CE, uh, the prophet personally led some, uh, some 300 warriors to raid Meccan merchants during the wars. And Muslims were, began to set ambushes on Meccan caravans at um, uh, Abar. However, the Meccans became aware of this plan and the Meccan caravans started to elude the Muslims, which created, started the Battle of Badar. Um, though Muhammad and the Muslims were significantly outnumbered, his followers were able to earn a victory. And so this, they saw, confirmed their faith. And the victory strengthened the prophet's position as a leader in Medina and dispelled any doubts among his early followers of who he claimed he was and claimed their mission. It was also during this time that uh, the prophet had expelled uh, some of the Jewish tribes in Medina. And so there's various traditions reasoning why this expulsion occurred, including an apocrypha tale of a Jew Jewish merchant forcibly um, derobing a Muslim woman in public. Um, but that's a fabrication. That's not a true story. Uh, there's also um, um, other traditions, but however I want to mention that is because this act is also is preserved in the Quran of this expulsion of Jews and it's said in a very harsh tone but in fact it's really more about uh, the prophet feeling that he was betrayed by people that he thought were dear to him so he had hurt feelings in a sense but a lot of these terms that he's using he's being specific about these particular Jews here but unfortunately within the tradition and history of Islam these words in the Quran get expatulated out and put upon all Jews. And so it, it unfortunately led to some periods of anti-Semitism by Muslims against Jews. Regardless of this, um, um, the Amekians were wanting to avenge their defeats and to maintain their economic prosperity over Medina. So around uh, between 624 and 625, the Meccans started having ambush parties, and it started again this whole war. And so, eventually, in March of March of, of 625, the Meccans again met the the Muslims uh, for battle, a pitched battle known as Battle of Uhud. And at this battle, Muhammad actually lost lost the battle. And the Meccans believed that the prophet had actually died in the battle too. And so they were very victorious and marched back in celebration. But however, news quickly spread that no, the prophet's not dead. And so new, more offensives were being launched. And so there was another famous battle that happened in 627 known as the Battle of the Trench, where the Meccans devised this great plan to use uh, uh, um, pagan tribes around Medina and some Jewish tribes around Medina to do a counterattack offensive while the Meccans attacked and they raised around 10,000 soldiers but um, uh, the prophet only had an army of about 2,000 soldiers 
And so um, uh, there was this huge fighting that lasted about 25 days during the Battle of the Trench, but ultimately Mecca uh, um, was defeated. The Prophet was victorious. And there was peace for a little while, but peace broke out again. And so finally in 630, around 630, Muhammad had enough. And so he decided to take the fight to the Meccans and um, marched on Mecca. Uh, and uh, however, um, I think he marched on with a, uh, a large force on Mecca and he was able to capture the city without any violence. There was no bloodshed in the city. Mecca surrendered once they saw the size of Muhammad's force and um, the prophet was able to seize the Kaaba, destroy all the idol statues there of the, uh, the ancient Arabian pantheon, cleanse the shrine, the Kaaba shrine that's there, um, and declare that the city was going to now be a holy city for Islam. And he uh, witnessed the public conversion of the leaders of Mecca to Islam. And so with the city being captured, uh, the prophet uh, worked the remainder of his life starting to unite all the various Arab tribes on the peninsula under the one religion of Islam. But in the year um, 632, the prophet started to begin what is known kind of as his farewell tour that he started instructing Islamic community to abolish the old tribal system that divided Arabs, uh, to abandon various pre-Islamic customs, to protect women, and to adhere to a lunar calendar. Um, and he's even recorded saying uh, during his fell world tour that, quote, today I have perfected your religion and completely excuse me, and completed my favors for you, and you have chosen Islam as the religion uh, for you. A few months after leaving uh, Mecca to go back home to Medina, where his, uh, his remaining family lived, uh, the prophet fell ill and suffered from several days from a fever, uh, headaches, and severe weakness, and would sub subsequently die on Monday, uh, June 8th, 632 CE, at the age of 62, 63, it's believed. Um, his tomb would become a mosque and is regarded as the second uh, holiest site in all of Islam. If I believe, it's known as the Green Mosque in Medina. And it's behind, um, um, uh, it's behind the Kaaba, which is the first holiest site, and just ahead of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Uh, in his life, the prophet had 13 wives altogether, but many of those were political marriages. Um, out of his uh, 13 wives, only nine of them survived after his death. Uh, the most pr prominent was his first wife, Khadija, uh, and then his third wife, Aisha, who was very important. And so those are the ones that are talked about the most. The others are just seen as political marriages in order to assure peace and to unite the tribes. Uh, the prophet had three children, oh, sorry, had uh, three sons. Uh, if I remember, right, all of the sons died during their childhood and had four daughters. And um, within Islamic tradition is believed that all of the prophet's children came from his first wife and that he had no other children from his other marriages. Uh, the prophet's most prominent children were his uh, was his daughter uh, Fatima, who would later marry Ali, uh, and who, uh, and leaving many Muslims to believe that only Fatima was actually Muhammad's biological daughter, um, that the others might have not been, that they could have adopted him. So there's a lot of traditions around the prophet, but this is who the prophet was. 
So now I think it's time for us to transition and talk about, we just finished talking about um, who was the prophet. So now let's talk about what is Islam and what does it teach? And like many of the uh, uh, Abrahamic religions that we have discussed in this class, the majority of these religions uh, teach does not come from the founder themselves, but rather come from collections of traditions, histories, and creeds that the believers were encouraged to hold. Um, however, the core elements of these Abrahamic religions can be traced back to the founder or to the time period of the founder or shortly after the founder. Uh, and if you to further complicate matters, if you recall, the prophet was adamant with his teachings concerning the fact that they didn't originate from him. Rather, he consistently and repeatedly told everybody that he was instructed to recite and to recite by the angel Gabriel. Therefore, it's kind of a great area to actually what the prophet taught, if he taught anything at all. And however, historians and scholars um, instead, uh, disagree, you know, they argue and agree whether Muhammad's claim and consider himself as religious innovator is true in the same manner as Confucius or Lao Tse within um, those traditions that we talked about of Confucianism and Taoism that they would say we're non-innovators, we're just repeating what we've been told before. The prophet was kind of saying the same thing, but I think he was an innovator. And however, there are some clear teachings and beliefs and practices that are attributed to the prophet and still the majority of Islam can be accredited to him and its traditions. Uh, but before we do that, it's very vitally important to recognize the time period and the historical circumstances that go on when the prophet emerged onto the world stage. So first, it's important to note that the prophet and Islam emerged in a time period when much of the Mediterranean and the Levant was dominated by Abrahamic traditions, and particularly Christianity. So prior to the advent of Islam, we are aware that of significant Jewish populations starting to migrate uh, due to safety issues and concerns uh, to the Arabian Peninsula uh, because of various conflicts that the Jews were having with the Roman Empire. So this is almost like a 600 year period of Jews migrating to this region. And so we know of Jews living in the Hezar region of Arabia. Uh, which is in the very northern part of Arabia, but also living in the cities of Mecca and Medina prior to the prophet. In fact, we know that in uh, Arabian history prior to Islam, there was in fact a Jewish kingdom ruled by a Jewish king in Arabia for a very short time. So Jews were very prominent in the Arabian Peninsula. We also know from Christian histories that many Christian monastics began to migrate and form ascetic communities throughout the Arabian Peninsula because of this vast desert that lended itself to asceticism. And so we have many of these Christian monasteries starting to dot the regions from the third century all the way up to the seventh century. And so that's why it explains why um, uh, the prophet and his first wife, Khadija, were able to go and meet another Christian and why this Christian was seen as having some expectation or some kind of authority. Also, we know from Arabian history that various Christian client kingdoms were established by the Byzantine Romans and that the area served as a buffer between Rome and Persia are by you know Constantinople and Persia if you want to say that. So the most famous of these Christian client kingdoms was that of Ghassanadi that uh, that existed from uh, 22 yeah 220 CE to 638 CE. Um, and it was the northern regions. So much of the northern regions of Air, of Arabia as well as parts of the southern regions of the modern day country of Jordan is where this kingdom lied. So despite that fact that, that the prophet probably practiced pre-Islamic Arabian uh, religion prior to his conversion, 
it is no doubt that the, the prophet was fully aware of Abrahamic religious traditions as well, and possibly might have even been a believer of some kind of hybrid form of an Abrahamic religion of what the Jews or the Christians believe. The Quran fully betrays the fact that it contains well-defined surveyic knowledge of Jew, Jewish and Christian traditions. So it shouldn't be surprised that the prophet did not see himself as a prophet inside the pre-Islamic Arabian traditions, but that of the Abrahamic traditions. So it made me believe that he probably was some kind of believer prior to his conversion, but we don't know. So as um, second, second issue here is that the Quran does depict Jesus and his relationship to God. It displays the fact that the prophet was fully aware of the ongoing debates within Christianity during the centuries uh, from the 4th to the 7th century surrounding the personhood of, of Jesus and the relationship of the Trinity. Uh, as we saw in our last lecture about Christianity, the early church was significantly divided between two camps of believers, the Monophytes and the Diophytes. The Monophytes believed in only one nature, which hence the word mono, one, uh, physis, nature, of Jesus, that of fully divine or of fully, fully human. And so um, the diaspites believed that Jesus was two, having two distinct but co-equal natures, that he was both God and man. So um, uh, Orthodox Christians are diaspites, as whereas monophytes are those who are, were the story in Christians in the regions. And so both camps had strong roots in the region. So the monophytes lived and reside in Egypt and in Palestine, whereas the Diophytes lived and reside in Syria, parts of Arabia, as well as Iraq. Lastly, what we mentioned is that starting in the 6th century, Christians, but more so Christians in the East, began to struggle with the use of images of God or the use of angels, images about Jesus, the Virgin Mary, saints in their sphere of art and worship. And if you recall, we, uh, we call these images icons, not idols, but icons. And these icons aren't simply artwork, but they're regarded as sacred image that is used to enhance religious devotion and to, uh, to improve uh, religious devotion. So the church teaches that these icons are tools of edification, are words put into painting, used indirectly to indicate God's presence, similar to how God instructed Aaron to create angels that adored the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, or how God instructed Moses to create a bronze serpent, serpent for people to look at and to be healed. So it's not an idol, but it's a tool, it's a tool of indirect indication of God's presence. However, if you read the Bible, and especially if you read the Ten Commandments, God instructs the people not to make, quote, graven images, which are translated as idols, not icons. In fact, various Christian Roman emperors made decrees to destroy pagan imageries and, and pagan temples, citing this verse as evidence. And the Great Library of Alexandria was burned by fanatical Christians in 415 who argued that these books need to be burned because they did not have edifying words or certain phrases towards God and Christian teachings. And again, a reaction to the Ten Commandments. And soon many Christians looked at Christian art the same way, as violating the Ten Commandments as a form of idolatry. Their views were justified in the, in the rapid decline of the Byzantine Empire that started in the late 500s and occurred, up, well, 
Yeah, the late 500s, and it was going on even well when the advent of Islam in the 7th century. Icons were used as a scapegoat to blame for the downfall of the Byzantine Empire, and the downfall was, in, was interpreted as a punishment by God for the use of these icons. And so this belief is known as iconoclasma, Icono, iconoclasma. So I C O N O C L A S M. And this iconoclasma was absorbed by Islam very early on because of this dynamic that some Christians that were going through this period were struggling with this and it bleed into Islamic thinking and Islamic thought, but that already existed in Judaism. So it could be that, the, that Islam had gotten this from Judaism as well. We don't know, but it isn't a coincidence. <coughs> Excuse me. And like Christianity and to some extent Judaism, um, Islam is uh, both a orthodox religion meaning that a religion in which it emphasizes the right teachings and that's what orthodoxy means the right teachings that a believer must have uh, to rightly confess and to hold in order to be considered part of the religion or to be considered orthodox uh, islam is both an orthodoxy religion as well as an orthopraxy religion and orthopraxy is religion uh, means that uh, emphasis on right practices that believers must have right practices in order to be considered part of orthodoxy and like Christianity Islam is also a creedal religion meaning that followers prescribe to a series of theological statements that's what creedal religion is followers who prescribe to a series of theological statements and with Islam, there are two specific terms that are used to describe their creedal ideology, Imam and Akida, which I rather use the term Akida. So Akida, which is not to be confused with the biblical event of the binding of Isaac in Genesis, that's known by the same name. Rather, Akida is an Arabic term meaning creed. Or it literally means to be tied into knots. So that's why it's that parallel, because that's the binding of Isaac's story, being tied into a knot. But this, the Akidah, refers to the traditional beliefs of Islam, the six articles of belief in Islam. So what are they? So the six articles of belief, also known as the Arkane al-Imam, are derived from both the Quran and from sunnas. Sunnas are collections of traditions and practices concerning the prophet and constitutes a model for Muslims to follow. The sunnas are found in hadiths, and the hadiths are referred to as a collection of writings that the majority of Muslims believe in and believe to record the words, actions, and approvals of the prophet as transmitted through chains of narrators, which are very important. And many Muslims see the authority of the Hadith as a source of religious law and moral guidance. So thus the Hadith ranks second only to the Quran in its importance within the religion. So what is these six articles of belief? The first, the first article of belief is the belief in Allah as the one and only God and in Islamic theology this is known as Tawhid. First the name Allah is simply the Arabic word that Arabs use for God. It's the same as Elohim in Hebrew and Semitic terms it just means God and so this is the same God of Judaism and Christianity. Christians and Jews who speak naturally Arab as their first language refer to God as Allah. So Allah should not be seen as a separate deity from Christianity or from Judaism. No, it's the same. It's just a different language. 
Uh, second, in Islam, Allah is seen as the eternal, uncreated creator. And Allah is seen as the sustainer of the universe. And so sometimes the phrase, the sustainer, al-Qayyum, is a specific term used in Christian and Islamic theology, which means that God maintains and nurtures and upholds everything in existence, the sustainer. He maintains and nurtures everything. Like Judaism and Christianity, uh, uh, Islam believes that God has no physical body or gender, but he's always referred to within the mas by the masculine pronoun. Um, but that sort of has changed um, with the rise of being gender conscious. But it's more rare within Islam, um, where it might exist more in Judaism and particularly Christianity. Islam rejects the Christian doctrine of incar incarnation or the Hindu doctrine of avatars, that the notion of a personal God having an anthropomorphic characteristics is what really Islam is rejecting. It's seen as demeaning God, who for Islam, God is very transcendent. God does not sleep. God does not hunger. God does not get tired. And because of his transcendence, God is never portrayed in any images, nor should he be in Islam. Instead, what, what is done in Islam is to portray God in art or to portray the prophet in art. They do it through cre uh, creative calligraphy, which I have some examples of later on in this slides. And so that is how they'll make art is through creative calligraphy of writing the name of God or writing the name of a person in a very creative way. Uh, so let's now talk about Tawhid. So the concept of Tawhid, which emphasizes the indivisibleness and oneness of God. So basically what Tawhid uh, means is a very, 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 very strict form of monotheism, much more similar to the same vein as Judaism. Tawhid is Islam's central and most single important concept upon which the entire rest of the religion rests upon. Tawhid requires Muslims not only to avoid worshiping multiple gods, but also requires them to relinquish striving for money, social status, and egotism, which is also forms of of gods, of false idols. So that's again why Islam is known as, uh, or Muslim is someone who submits, relinquishes. The concept of Tahid is linked to that idea to submit, to surrender, to relinquish. So that's why it's very, very important. And that is what the uh, the real faith of Islam is is an act of surrender, a surrender of your actions, a surrender of your behaviors, a surrender of your will, a surrender of your life to God's mercy. And while you will say, well, Christianity is also a religion of surrender as well, but not really. As we saw, Christianity is about developing a relationship. A relate this type of relationship doesn't really exist in Islam. So this is why Islam's a little bit different. Thus, to attribute divinity to anything else or anyone else is shriek, and which is the most unpardonable sin within Islam. To attribute something else to God. So this is why this is the most central belief within Islam. Second is the belief. In angels. Now, this article of faith makes logical sense because of the nature of the revelation of the Quran to the prophet. If you don't believe in angels, then how the hell can Gabriel give the divine message to Muhammad? That's a pretty big hole in your theology if you don't believe in angels. So it's very important. So within Islam, angels are believed to be heavenly beings created by God who perform different roles and who are without sin 
and in, in Arab that's Ishma without sin. So some of the roles, what are some of these roles? Some of these roles are uh, angels that sing praises to God for all eternity. Uh, angels who interact with humans, giving them messages from God. Angels who fight demons like St. Michael within, uh, within Catholicism and Christianity. Or angels who carry out natural phenomenons at the will of God. Or angels who carry the souls of the deceased, or angels who participate in the end time. So they have various different roles within Islam. But unlike Islamic beliefs about God, angels are described in very anthropomorphic ways. They're described as beings full of light and surrounded by fire. However, it is still haram, and haram in, in Islam is uh, that which is forbidden. So it's still Quran to draw or create an image of the angel. Uh, besides Gabriel, uh, who's the most famous of the uh, uh, angels in Islam, as well as in Judaism and Christianity, there's also Michael, who exists in Christianity, who's the angel of mercy and is responsible for natural phenomena. There's the angel Raphael, who's the angel of music, and who will blow the trumpet to signal the day of judgment that Islam believes in, as well as the angel Azrael that appears in Judaism as well, who is the angel of death that ferries souls from the body of, of the dead to heaven. Uh, so with angels too, it's very important that uh, this belief also has different nuances within Sufism, and we'll get to, to talk about Sufism later, but in Sufism, angels can become companions of individuals, in which humans can seek them out for guidance and help to help them transcend mystically and spiritually within the upper realms of Islam. But we'll talk about Sufism here later, but I just wanted to mention that as well. Uh, the third article of belief is belief in the Islamic holy books. While most people uh, ask what are the holy books of, of Islam, everybody would universally say that's the Quran. If I was to ask you here today, you would say that is the Quran, and you would be right. However, Islam is part of the Abrahamic traditions. And Muslims believe various prophets have received messages from God and have received revelations, which they call Wayi. As part of being a part of the Abrahamic tradition, ergo Muslims also believe that previous revealed scriptures, those of Judaism, so the Torah, or in Islam they call it Taurat, or the Psalms, Zabur, are scripture. Same thing with Christianity. They believe that the Gospels, or the New Testament, which in Islam they call Ninjil, are scriptures. But there is a difference. So Muslims will believe that the Torah, they'll believe the Old Testament, they believe the New Testament are scriptures of God, Muslims believe that, however, these writings have been distorted and distorted from their original revelation, known as Tarif. So within Islamic tradition, Tarif has occurred within Christianity and Judaism uh, in their interpretations of the Holy Scriptures and have later uh, in their transmission of these texts. And so the texts have been corrupted. So Islam is very aware of the scholarly debates of textual criticism being performed by Christians during and Jewish Jews during this period. So they're very aware of that. So they know of the problems, and this is what they point to as why these texts have been distorted. So an example of this is one: there's huge differences between Hebrew manuscripts of the of the Hebrew Bible and Greek manuscripts. Various passages missing various different words being used in translations. And there's a huge difference between Samaritan manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts. And there's a huge difference between Aramaic manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. So the Muslims were very aware of this. 
And also they're aware of that several scriptures of the same book written at different times contain extra words. So an example of this would be Mark's gospel. That Mark's gospel has an alternative ending that is not preserved in the earliest manuscripts, but are preserved in later manuscripts, meaning it's been added. Or that there's extra chapters in the book of, of John, the gospel of John. Islam is very aware of that. So Islam is very aware of all these things and how, and so thus they, they reason within themselves, how can a religious group claim the doctrine of inerrancy, which inerrancy means without error. So how could they claim their scriptures are without error when their own history and their own traditions indicate that these scriptures are full of errors? Also, how can the strict Christians claim to be strict monotheistics, yet they believe in a polytheistic trinity? It's because of a misinterpretation. That's how Muslims describe it. And so that's to many Muslims' minds, the Quran is the only recognized, is recognized and is seen as the culmination of a series of divine messages that start back with Adam and ends with the prophet Muhammad and is seen as the final and corrected revelation from God. So they might believe in these other books, but the Quran is the correct book. The fourth article of belief is the belief in the prophet and his messenger. So again, Islam sees itself as part of the Abrahamic tradition and thus believes in many of the same histories and stories, especially the prophets. Islam believes that God has chosen and called a series of prophets throughout history. That's called Abraham, it's called Elisha, it's called Noah, it's called Adam, it's called Jesus, John the Baptist. Muslims believe all of this. And that all of these prophets have preached the same basic message that the prophet Muhammad preaches in their time. The submission to the will of God. Islam does not believe that these prophets had erred in their original message as an explanation as to why Islam is different than Christianity. Rather, they say that followers of Judaism and Christianity and of their traditions that have come after these prophets have gravely misinterpreted them and have misled subsequent generations after the prophet's death. And thus why Jesus needed to come and to correct things because the Jews had messed things up and why Muhammad needed to come because Christians have messed things up. This means that Jesus, in their mind, even though he was a prophet, this means that Jesus and Islam never made the claim that he was God's son or that people should worship him because that runs counter to the idea of in Deuteronomy, in the Shema, God is one, of Tawhid, of strict monotheism. Jesus would never say that because these, this is a prophet of God, and so the prophet of God would not contradict himself. So it has to be a misinterpretation by later followers. It has to be a distortion of the truth by later followers that produce these claims. Furthermore, Muslims believe that prophets are humans and are not divine figures, meaning that no prophet would claim that he should be worshipped or that they should be worshipped, which again is another strike against Christianity with the personhood of Jesus. Prophets in Islam are exemplary, ordinary humans. They exhibit model characteristics of righteousness, and moral conduct. Unlike other human beings, prophets have the quality of isma, which is sinless. Um, the concept of uncorruptibleness. Immunity is a better word. And that they're protected by God from making a mistake or committing grave sins. Traditionally in Islam, prophets have only been male as well. Women cannot be prophets within Islam. However, there are great debates within Islam if Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
it should be seen as a prophet based on Surah 12, 109, which reads, quote, We, meaning Allah here, have only sent men prior to you, meaning the prophets, and you being Mary. End quote. And so some Muslim traditions have argued that Mary, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and Aisha, the mother of Moses, were also prophetess as well. Um, so there are some traditions, but most traditionally, it's always a male role. The fifth, the fifth article here is the belief in the last judgment and the belief in the resurrection. So with Islam, the day of resurrection, known as uh, Yam al-Qayyama, uh, is a crucial article of belief for Muslims. It is believed to be the time of Qiyama, and the time of Qiyama is preordained by God and unknown by man. But it's a period similar to what is taught in Christianity, a period of trials and tribulation. Uh, nevertheless, uh, 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 Islamic traditions do not indicate that there will be a host of signs prophesied and predicted when the end of days comes. Uh, are they, sorry, they do believe these things. Let me rephrase that. I think I said they don't. They do believe that there would be several signs predicting these. And it would be immorality would be prevalent pre throughout the world. Unnatural phenomenons would occur, uh, appearances of dark skies, satanic evils such as the Antichrist or the Dajjal would appear. Uh, the nations of Gog and Megog will emerge and do mischievous things on the nation. A tyrant will appear known as the Sufayani. And then the final uh, sign of the end times coming would be the arrival of a messianic figure such as the Mahdi, which is Islam's version of the Messiah, as well as Islam believes in the return of Jesus, that Jesus would return to restore justice. In Islam, uh, um, so yeah, yeah, which is, let me, let me stop there for a minute. Muslims believe in Jesus. And they believe Jesus will return again. That's very important. And it's very confusing because, again, they think, oh, Muslims don't believe in Jesus. Only Christians believe in Jesus. But no, Muslims do. And he's very important within Islamic uh, uh, eschatology, which is the study of last, last things, last days, the end times. And so in Islam, Jesus is very important is to be, and is believed to be the, the, the last prophet that God will send again and the last messenger of God. In the Quran, Jesus is described as the Messiah, born of a virgin, performing miracles and accompanied by a disciple, but rejected by the Jewish establishment and being taken to heaven. Uh, the Quran asserts that Jesus wasn't crucified or that he died on a cross, but was miraculously saved by God. And the Quran places Jesus amongst the greatest of all of God's prophets outside of Muhammad, but it rejects the incarnation of Jesus and Jesus being the son of God. In Islam, as I said before, they believe that Jesus is going to come again, that he'll descend onto earth and unlike Christianity, Jesus is returning to assist the Mahdi in killing the Antichrist and to put an end to Christian misconceptions about there being a son of God. And also to um, um, stop some other corruptions within the religion of Judaism. And Jesus and the Mahdi will rule together and will rule in the earth and will uh, perfect justice during this time, this day of judgment. And so Muslims believe that all humankind will be judged and they'll be judged by their good and bad deeds and are consigned either to heaven or paradise, which is known as Jayan or hell, 
Ja'an Nama. Those who died prior to the judgment day will be resurrected, similar to beliefs in Christianity. And not everyone consigned to hell will remain there, unlike Christianity, as it is believed that all but the, um, the people who have committed the worst sin, which is known as Musharik, uh, uh, and that's, if you remember, Sharik is, is um, idolatry. So those who have committed idolatry can um, have the possibility of being saved. Because um, it's all about God's mercy. So that's something that's a little bit different within um, Islam as opposed to Christianity. The last article of belief, the sixth article of belief, is the belief in predestination or uh, Qadar. Qadar is the concept of divine destiny. As God is an omniscient, meaning all-knowing, an omnipotent, all-powerful being, that everything happens and will happen in the universe, including sinful behavior, is known only by God and has been ordained by God or caused to happen by God. So Muslims call this ordained fate, um, the will of Allah, or inshallah. You might hear that as well, inshallah, which means if God wills it. So while God has predestined all things in Orthodox Islam, human beings have the choice to do good or evil and are responsible for their actions and will be rewarded or punished according to the eternal, uh, in the eternal afterlife. So they do have an element of free will, but for them, it's still debated. It's still considered that, well, do humans have coexistence or determinism, predestination? Within Islamic tradition, it's interesting that the faithful are encouraged not to talk about this, to accept predestination. Uh, there's a tradition that says, quote, the prophet taught believers to abstain from considerations about Qadar, calling it a deep sea, a dark path, or God's secret, end quote. So in that response, Muslims see their human life as a test, a test from Allah that all human, human beings must make their own decisions, but those own decisions have been predetermined. So it's a little unorthodox of what they believe, but it's because they have a very strong view of God. Along with the six articles of faith, Muslims also believe in five fundamental practices in Islam that are part and parcel of their religion. And so these practices, these five practices are known as the five pillars, which are considered obligatory acts of worship. So in Islam, these obligatory acts are called abanda which is generally translated as servitude or slavery, but that again is paints Islam in a very awful delight or awful light. Instead, Muslims translate uh, ibadah as worship or devotion, not servitude. So the five pillars of Islam are not seen as obligatory acts of service, but obligatory acts of worship. They are viewed as compulsory as gen for individuals who generally wish to pursue a life that which the prophet had led and is mindful. And so this is very important. So again, they're not to be seen as uh, obligatory acts of servitude, but seen as acts of worship. So these are the five basic practices that all Muslims do. So the first of these pillars is known as the shahada, or the testimony or the declaration of faith. And the shahada operates as both as a basic statement of, cre of, of, of cre uh, creedal faith and creedal theology. 
Um, but it's more importantly, it's a sacred oath that all Muslims declare. And so the statement goes something like this, quote, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. The statement has two theological causes. The first cause is basically the Tawheed all over again, the declared belief in the absolute oneness of God. It promotes the unity of Islam as a faith, meaning we do not have many gods, but have only one God that we worship. There is no God but Allah. The second clause is a de declaration of the acceptance of, the prof of, of Muhammad as God's messenger and prophet. And this second clause demonstrates the essential mercy that is inherent to Islam. That because of God's mercy, he sent Muhammad. He called Muhammad and gave him the words that it's not an act of grace, so much say it's an act of mercy. So in Islam, mercy is seen very, very highly and thought highly of the mercy of God. And so this is an act of mercy that he sent Muhammad to the people. And the Shahada is what all people who of the Islamic persuasion profess in order to convert to Islam. The Shahada is a public confess profession of faith. And it is said five times during your prayers. It is the first thing that is said to a newborn after they're born, and it's the last thing that a person hears upon their deathbed, showing the Muslim prayer and the pillar as an instrument from day a person is born until the day a person is dead. However, for Shia Muslims, and we'll talk more about this denomination in a minute, um, they add a third clause to the Shahada. And so Shia Muslims, their statement would read, there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is, is, is the prophet or the messenger of God, and Ali is the Wali of God. And so the phrase Wali is usually translated as custodian or chosen by God, but custodian is the more proper term, and is mostly common used for Muslims to indicate Islamic saint. A wali. So Ali is a saint of God or a custodian of God. But we'll talk more about that once we get to Shia Muslims. The second pillar of Islam is the Salah or the Salat, depending on pronunciation. And it refers to a set of prayers said by all Muslims. The majority of Muslims pray five times a day and they pray at certain prescribed periods of the day. Um, but a majority of Muslims, or minor, uh, um, yeah, minority, a minority of Muslims only pray about three times a day. But again, the, the vast majority of Muslims pray five times a day. Uh, the five times are the uh, Fajr, which is observed at dawn, the Zuhr, which is observed at noon, Ashur, which is observed uh, late in the afternoon two o'clock-ish, three o'clock. Uh, the uh, Makarib, which is observed after sunset. And the Isha, which is observed at night. The prayers can be done anywhere on earth at any time, or not any time, but can be done, yeah, at, at anywhere, any place, and they can be formed in either absolute solitude, so you can be by yourself, or they can be uh, per, uh, performed as a collective, when it's performed as a collective, it's known as a um, jama'a, where worshippers line up in parallel rows behind the leader who is known as an imam. Uh, Muslims are also prescribed to pray a certain way. Each salah is made up of repeating units known as rakat, and each prayer consists of two to four rakats, which rakats consist of specific movements like bowing with hands on knees, as you can see in the image there, standing, prostrating, and sitting in special positions, but not sitting on your heels nor sitting on your butt, and recitation, reciting things. 
Before the prayer, Muslims should always perform the wudu, which is an act of ritual washing of the hands, the mouth, the nose, the face, the arms, arms all the way up to the elbow, the head, and finally the feet. And that all these prayers are to be recited while facing the Qibla, which is a direction of Mecca, of, of it's the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. And so um, that's the direction you're supposed to face when praying. And most mosques contain what is known as the mirab, which is a place in the wall, kind of a niche in the wall, that which indicates the direction of the Qibla, of where you're to be. So depending on where you're on the globe, the, uh, the mirab and the Qibla will never be consistently of where it's pointing to because it's always pointing to Mecca. So it might be on the west, it might be in the north, it might be in the south, it might be in the east side of the building, but you're paying that direction. And previously, um, yeah, which is a side note here, previously uh, uh, the prophet and his Muslim followers actually prayed towards Jerusalem prior to always praying towards Mecca. Um, but they changed that um, later when they captured Mecca. The third pillar is the Sakat. The Sakat refers to the giving of charity or alms. And Sakat is a religious duty that all Muslims who, uh, um, who meet the, the necessary criteria of wealth are to perform, which is to help the needy. However, within Islamic theology, the zakat is not solely seen as an act of charity, but an act of purification, reminding Muslims that all things belong to God. Uh, it's traditionally that Muslims give 2.5% of their total earnings and total wealth within a year as part of the zakat. Um, and there, uh, which is always supposed to be um, basically, um, yeah, around 2.5%. And an interesting fact is that the practice of zakat is actually not found in the Quran, but rather in the Hadith. And the tax used is to take care of the holy places and to take care of the mosque as well as to give assistance to those who are needy and are impoverished. Uh, and today in six majority Muslim countries, the, the zakat is actually enforced and collected by the state. So it's kind of seen as a religious tax by certain Islamic countries. But it's designed to be not only an act of charity, but an act of purification. So the next thing, is the fourth pillar, Swam. And Swam refers to the mandatory fast conducted by all Muslims during the month of Ramadan. And so within Islam, fasting is the practice of abstaining from food, from any kind of drink, from smoking, and from sexual activity for a specific time period in order to form spiritual discipline and spiritual self-control, or really bodily self-control too. But however, during the month of Ramadan, fasting is observed for an entire month, but a lunar month, so 28, 29 days. And for, uh, from the, uh, um, 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 and between dawn and nightfall every night. And so the month, the holy month of Ramadan uh, occurs in the ninth month within the Islamic calendar. And it's a month long commemoration of Muhammad receiving the revelations that would become the Quran. So it lasts around 29 days from the sighting of one crescent moon to the next. Ramadan is also known as a floating holiday, um, which means it moves year to year and it can move um, uh, 10 to 11 days with, uh, from the last year it occurred. So for example, in 2022, Ramadan started May 2nd, 
and 2023 Ramadan starts um, March 22nd, and in uh, 2024 it starts in March 10th. So you can see it moving um, 10 to 11 days in those time frames. Uh, Muslims also celebrate during Ramadan the reception of the Christian and Jewish Bibles and traditions and sacred texts as well. And during the month of Ramadan, Muslims devote more time to prayer, more time to acts of charity, more time to striving to improve themselves uh, by reading and, and being motivated upon the Hadith, which states that, quote, when Ramadan arrives, the gates of paradise are open and the gates of hell are closed and the devil is put in his chains. So more religious piety goes on during this time. Uh, at sunset during Ramadan, Muslims families break their fast with what is known as the iftar, which is a celebratory meal, and traditionally the meal bring, begins with the eating of dates, in which uh, there's a hadith that this is what the prophet had done. Anytime he broke his fast was to eat a date. Um, not like a, <laughs> let, me, let me make this clear, not like a physical date, like a person, um, but the fruit, the date fruit that he would eat that's very sweet and almost like tastes like candy in, in any sense. Um, uh, but in the United States and in the UK, the in, uh, iftar is very much a so, social gathering and, and, and sometimes during these meals it's even open to non-Muslims as well, so it's a great time to go. Uh, Islamic traditions do contain precautionary conditions in which a person shouldn't fast and participate during Ramadan. So, for example, if a woman is pregnant, she shouldn't fast. Um, uh, if she's experiencing her period, she shouldn't fast. Or if anybody is ill, if they got a fever, if they fall sick, they shouldn't fast. They should break the fast, take care of themselves. Because all Muslims are allowed to break the fast in order to take care of themselves, but then are expected to pick it up once they feel better, any days that they miss during the fast. So it's quite reasonable. The last, the last pillar, the fifth and final pillar, is that of the Hajj which is an obligatory religious pilgrimage that all Muslims must perform at least once in their life towards Mecca. And so the Hajj, which means a journey, is a demonstration of solidarity of the Muslim people and their solidarity towards the submission to God. It is also a reenactment ritual of the events and the stories surrounding the patriarch Abraham. So this, the Hajj pilgrimage is performed over five to six days during the Islamic month of, ha, of Du al Khalaj, in which Muslims from all over the world descend on Mecca, and the Hajj is seen as to have a spiritual merit that provides Muslims with an opportunity of self-renewal, uh, as well as a physical reminder of the day of judgment. In reality, the Hajj consists of two pilgrimages. Well, one that's known as the Greater Hajj and the other one as the Lesser Hajj. So the, the Lesser Hajj consists of primarily visiting the Kaaba and it consists of two rituals. The two rituals being, um, yeah, the two rituals being uh, Tafwa and Saya. So Tafwa, um, involves walking seven times counterclockwise around the Kaaba. And each circuit starts with the kissing or touching of the black stone and reciting a prayer. Uh, this rite is said to be the manifestation of Tahid, the oneness of God. The Tawaf is followed by Sayah, which involves running or walking seven times between within the uh, Kaaba area, the hills of Safa and Marwa. And this rite is a reenactment of the story of Hagar from the biblical story. Oh, Hagar is a maidservant of Sarah who was given to Abraham by Sarah as a bride in order for uh, 
uh, Abraham to have a son. But once she had a son, uh, uh, Sarah was jealous and forced Hagar into exile in order to die. And the story goes that Hagar desperately, at one point, desperately searches for water, running around panicky in the desert looking for water until God rescues her, hears her cries, and provides water miraculously in a spring. And so Muslims reenact this at the Sayyah. So those are the lesser hajjs. The greater hajj consists of a journey outside of Mecca, and which is also a reenactment, but a reenactment of the life of Abraham. And on the eighth day of the hajj, pilgrims exit the city of Mecca and travel about eight kilometers south to Mina, which is uh, refers to the city of tents. And it's where they spend the whole day in prayer and is a place where uh, supposedly and within Islamic tradition, God visited Abraham in his dream to tell him that he needed to go and sacrifice his firstborn son, Ishmael. And at this point, I want to note in Jerusalem, in Judaism and in Christianity, this is actually Isaac that Abraham has this dream about. But in Islam, uh, Islam sees Ishmael as the promised child because again he is the firstborn son and and same as in the Hebrew Bible and Christian Bible as well Ishmael is the firstborn son of Abraham on the ninth day of the Hajj pilgrims then travel another 12 more kilometers south to Mount Afarat or in Arabic, Jabal, um, Jabal ar Ramma, where pilgrims stand in place and they stand in a contemplative vigil. They all do stand in place and they're all contemplating, offering supplications and repentance for their past and their past sins while seeking God's mercy and listening to sermons for the day. Standing, standing still. After the sermon and until sunset, pilgrims are to stand facing the mountain, which symbolizes them standing before God on the day of judgment. Then once the night uh, occurs, they break their, their standing by hosting a big feast in which a uh, lamb, sometimes a camel, is sacrificed and eaten. Um, in, a, in a barbecue to, re, to remember and remind them of God providing a lamb to, uh, to Abraham uh, in place of his son. On the 10th day of the Hajj, pilgrims then return to the city of Mina, where they symbolically perform a ritual which is known as the stoning of the devil, in which they throw seven stones at a very tall pillar, which is supposed to represent the devil. And so this reenactment is a representation of the devil trying to tempt Abraham to disobey God and to not sacrifice his son Ishmael. And on the 12th and 13th day of the Hajj, the pilgrimage returns to Mecca and they perform the ta uh, Tawaf for the final time of their journey. And traditionally, during the Hajj, many Muslims travel um, another 400 kilometers north to Medina to visit the tomb of Muhammad. Um, and like I said, this is a, re a religious obligation for all Muslims to perform at least once in their lifetime. However, Islamic tradition does contain various social and health conditions which a Muslim is not to uh, proceed on their journey if they are ill or if they are poor or if a woman is pregnant they're not to be permitted to travel on the Hajj um, before we continue on our discussion I think it's important to talk about the Kaaba which we've talked about a little bit here and there in our lecture and what it is and why is it so significant the Kaaba is the most sacred and significant physical place in the religion of Islam. It is considered with Islam to be the house of God or Bayat Allah. 
and is to believe also as the first mosque constructed by the prophet Adam and then later uh, I think Abraham too, to God. According to Islamic tradition, the Kaaba was uh, um, was constructed first for angels to worship God before the creation of man. However, the Kaaba was destroyed during the great flood of Noah as humans were so corrupted by the worship of other idols. It was later rebuilt by Abraham and his son Ishmael. Uh, however, since, the, since his days, the true purposes of the Kaaba was lost, and thus local tribes were able to corrupt it again with the worship of false gods. And it's believed that the only portion of the Kaaba that is original to the time of Abraham is the black stone that Muslims are to touch, and it's in one of the corners of the building. The black stone is this rock that's set in the eastern corner of the building and is to believe to be a stone that fell from heaven during the time of Adam and Eve. However, scientists and historians um, argue that the black stone is either a meteorite or a volcanic stone, but no one knows because they're not able to study it. Um, the Kaaba itself is the shrine. It's a stone cube-like shrine structure that, shri that is shrouded by a black curtain uh, within uh, and, and, and inside there's marble and limestone floors inside there's three pillars and six tablets lining the walls with inscriptions from the Quran and there's also a small table and a small altar inside and a staircase that leads to a roof and in the middle there's a lamp that's hanging there in the ceiling but I can't remember all the significant reasons for all of that. But I wanted to mention about the Kaaba stone. So the next thing that I want to talk about is life of Islam after the prophet. And so like many of the founder religions um, that we have talked about in this class, founder religions as well as new religious movements in which Islam was, at the time it started, often experience a crisis of leadership following the death of their founder, and Islam was no exception. But unlike Buddhism, in which Siddhartha diffused the political the potential crisis by declaring there was going to be no success successor, the prophet's death was so sudden that it caused a crisis over succession. Who was going to lead the community? And uh, there was no clear path of succession. So the prophet's deaths and his sudden death leaves three questions for the community to answer and how they're going to answer this. One was who was going to lead the community? Number two, how was the leader going to be chosen? And three, what kind of authority was the leader going to have? And this caused huge debates and helped split Islam shortly after because no one could agree on all three. So first, let's look at, let's look at the first one. Let's look at who was going to lead the community. Uh, one small but significant group of Muslims pushed for a line of succession that would come through the family of the prophet. After all, that was how it was done in pre-Islamic times in Arabia. It was a tribal system built on a tribal scale that had dominated Arabian society. This group lobbied for the appointment of Ali, uh, who was Muhammad's son-in-law through his marriage to Fatima, the prophet's favorite daughter, because again, the prophet had no sons. They all died in childbirth or childhood. Um, and uh, so, uh, and also, Ali was also a cousin of Muhammad, so it made him even more in line to succession because he was more of a male heir to the Prophet. Uh, but however, a much larger group of Muslims believed that the Prophet's successor should be the best available person, regardless of their lineage. 
this group lobbied for uh, the spirit and the essence in which uh, Muhammad led his community, meaning that the prophet fought to break up the tribal dynamics and, and that kept the Arab tribes divided. And so we don't need to go back to that. So thus we need to have a more democratic form of leadership. Muhammad rose above the tribal system and united all Arabs under a common sense of identity, that of religion over tribalism. So we shouldn't be looking towards the past for examples of how we should proceed in the future. Still, other Muslims and Arabs believe that God would call up a new prophet to lead the community in the same manner that he called Muhammad, so they started looking for other prophets. But truth be told, many Arabs just simply wanted to take advantage of the crisis and either reassert their tribal dominance or to carve out new ones caused by this religion by claiming they were the prophets. So various prophets actually emerged shortly after the prophet who are all labeled false prophets. So no one knew how it was supposed to happen. The majority said we needed the best chosen, but still there was a significant minority who sided with Ali. Second, let's look at how the leader was going to be chosen. After the death of Muhammad in 632, the Islamic community needed to appoint a new leader, which gave rise to the caliphs. The term caliph means just simply successor. And in subsequent Islamic um, empires would use that term caliphates to describe their kingdoms as successors to the kingdom of Medina, in a sense. <clears throat> and the period that immediately followed uh, Muhammad was known as the Rashundi Caliphate or the period of the four rightly guarded caliphs. So according to popular Islamic traditions, following the death of Muhammad, a meeting was called among the original followers of the community to appoint a new leader of the Islamic community, the Ummah. It was reasoned that those who were part of the original group of followers of the Prophet had the greater sense and authority to choose the future direction of the community. After all, they had been through all of the highs and had been through all of the lows along with the prophet, and they knew the prophet best and his wishes. Um, and it's with, within Islamic tradition, these early followers are simply known as the command, companions of the prophet. And within Islam, the, the companions are classified into various categories. So there are the uh, Muhajirun, uh, who, uh, which means those who accompany Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. The Ansar are those who, early followers who lived in Medina. And then there's the Badirun, or those who fought at, at the Battle of uh, Badar. So the ones who chose the leader and had the highest level of honor were those who lived with Muhammad in Mecca and would later travel to Medina when the prophet left. And so the story goes that during the preparations of the prophet's body for funeral, that the Ansar met in secret and chose to appoint um, Sayyid Ibn Ubdab as the caliph as he was the most prominent tribal leader there in Medina. So there was a fear that the Meccans would try to reverse their faith since this only happened two years earlier. So the Medinans still wanted to gain control. However, story goes that um, Abu Bark and Umar, uh, another companion that we'll talk about here later, heard of this secret meeting and then decided to break it up, arguing that the actions of this meeting would lead to a civil war among the Ummah. And peace was in fact the most important thing that needed to be have right now. 
So according to legend, while various names are being offered, the Muslim community as a whole was inspired by the leadership of Abu Barak during this time and his wisdom of how he always was able to say the right things to keep the peace and the common communities down. So instead, it was he who was chosen to be the successor or to be the caliph. But however, not everybody was thrilled with this decision. The pro-Ali group of Muslims argued that during Muhammad's farewell pilgrimage from Mecca in 632, uh, that um, the prophet stopped at the oasis of Gadir to give a sermon. And that during the sermon, Muhammad took Ali's hand and while he was talking, in giving a speech, he said that they should follow Ali as the next successor to the community. However, scholars and historians of, of, of Islam argued that the events of Ghadir Qum, uh, as it's known, uh, were, are, even though they are well attested in Islamic tradition, the event doesn't get recorded until 200 years later. So many people uh, view its authentic authenticity with a suspicious eye. And with how the community responded to the proclaimers for Ali, it leads to me, it leads me to believe that, that this event might be fictional as the significant larger section of the community would have respected the wishes of the prophet if that actually had been made clear. So it makes me believe that this was a, a work of fiction, but I don't know. Only speaking as an academic. But what is known is that Ali and Fatima initially did accept Abu Barak's claim of leadership, which further entrenched a succession crisis wouldn't occur because or, or would occur because they didn't accept it. So Abu... <laughs> Kali, uh, Abu Barak's caliphate only lasted about two years and it was consumed with dealing with rival false prophets who emerged within the community and, and trying to reunite all the Arab tribes that Muhammad had previously uh, uh, united. So, so this time period is known as the War of Apostasy. Uh, and, but however, it's believed at this time that uh, uh, um, Abu Barak was able to bring the modern day nation of Iraq under the influence of, of Islam prior to his death. In 634 uh, CE, uh, the leadership of the caliphate passed to Umar, or sometimes you'll see Omar as well. Umar was a close friend of Abu Barak and was actually the father-in-law to the prophet in one of the many political marriages that the prophet had undergone. Um, and so he was chosen second. And Umar continued to spread Islam, and he was the one who spread it probably the fastest and the most during his 10-year period spreading it throughout Mesopotamia, Syria, parts of Palestine, and Egypt, all coming under Islamic influence. And while the, the caliphate continued to expand, uh, have a rapid expansion, Umar laid the foundations of a political structure that would hold it together. He created the Diwan, which was a... Uh, a bureau for transacting government affairs um, and turning the Islamic community from a tribal structure to that of a small kingdom to that of an empire. And he also brought the military under the direct control of the state rather than relying on various tribes leading various segments of the military. Um, crucial in conquering lands, Umar did not require that any non-Muslims in the populations that they conquered be forced to convert to Islam, but instead he allowed subject populations to retain their religion, maintain their, their language and customs, 
but instead he left governments and he left the governments also um, uh, relatively untouched but only imposing on them a governor and a financial officer who was a Muslim and an Arab so making sure that the money came in and that the basic and the overall governance was still loyal Umar is also remembered for the, uh, establishing the Islamic lunar calendar and setting its beginning to 622, the year that Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina. But unfortunately, in the year 644, Umar was unfortunately assassinated during a morning prayer by a Persian slave. Um, and so... Uh, there was a bit of a succession crisis. But however, foreshadowing or with great foresight, before his death, Umar um, created a committee of six who would be in charge of selecting the next successor. And after Umar's death, the committee was split in their decision between two of the Prophet's son-in-laws, Ali and Uthman. However, the committee chose Uthman. And while the first six years of Uthman's reign as the caliph was popular, his latter six was very unpopular. But Uthman was very influential and, and successful in spreading Islamic influences across northern Africa, and to the island nations of Rhodes, Cyprus, and Sicily, and even reaching the far banks of the Indus River in, in South Asia. It was also Uthman who was responsible for compiling and editing the various revelations of the Prophet into a written book, which would become the Quran. Um, however, dissatisfaction quickly emerged with his leadership and his decision to appoint non-Arabs and his family members to key positions within the caliphate. And so in uh, uh, 656, uh, Uthman was killed by protesters who stormed his house and killed him in his home. And this started the first civil war, or known as the first finta that divided the Islamic community into two camps. Following the assassination, really, um, the, or the death of Uthman, we do have the final caliph, Ali. Uh, Ali was elected by rebel forces in Medina, and Ali quickly moved his government and the government of Islam away from Saudi Arabia and its traditional roots and moved it to modern-day Iraq uh, in Kufa and began uh, removing all of the relatives of Uthma from leaderships within the caliphate. Demands for revenge of Uthman's death and, uh, and death and demands of revenge against Ali emerged among Uthman's relatives and followers, particularly um, uh, Zubara, um, and particularly among Aisha, which is one of the wives of Muhammad and the daughter of Abu Barak, and uh, but more particularly around Umayy. And soon the civil war emerged. The first civil war emerged between Ali and his followers and the rest of the Islamic community. Uh, but the Civil War subsequently ended with the assassination of Ali in 661 when his allies, the Kaharajites, uh, betrayed him and sought peace with his enemy, Muwaya. Muwaya. And Muwaya would turn, uh, turn his claim to the caliphate and claim the caliphate for himself and establish the famed uh, Umayyad caliphate that would begin the first real great Islamic dynasty and empire throughout history. However, Muslims at Kufu uh, uh, rallied around Ali's eldest son, um, Hassan ibn Ali, as rightful caliph, and the two rival 
caliphates were established, but only for a short while, which was led to the Second Civil War. Um, Hassan's forces were to surrender his caliphate in 661, and Muslims uh, uh, who followed Ali continued to rebel. But when uh, Muawi died in 680, Ali's youngest son, Hussein ibn Ali, openly rebelled against the Umayyads and tried to reclaim the caliphate. But Muawi's son, Yazid, uh, claimed the title as well, caused another civil war to happen. Uh, but however, Hussein and his followers, uh, his forces, uh, met the Umayyads at the Battle of Karbala. And like his father, Hussein was betrayed and was violently murdered. But the followers of Ali see Hussein's murder as a martyrdom. And so his death was again followed by civil war and subsequently splitting of the denominations of Islam, its rival camps. But for our last question, question three, what kind of authority was the successor to the prophet going to have? Uh, this question speaks directly to the differences between the two predominant sects of Islam. And so starts um, where we talk about the various schools of Islam. So let us talk about now the, the, the largest of the schools of Islam being Sunni Islam or Sunniism. It's the largest Muslim religious group accounting for around 85%, I think a little bit less, I'd say 80 to 85% of all Muslims in the world. Sunnis are literally found on every continent that you can see. Um, you can see that they're found all throughout Africa, the Middle East, parts of, of Europe, um, there in the map, and then of course in the United States as well. Um, uh, but they, their majority within the traditional Islamic states, you can see there, are in the hearts um, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, um, Jordan, um, Egypt as well. The word Sunni comes from the Arabic word Sunnah which means tradition. And so Sunni Islam is generally considered as Orthodox Islam. And much of what we've already discussed concerning the beliefs and practices of Islam are very much in fact Sunniism. So, but for question three, Sunnis reject the idea of leadership through the prophetic family on the basis of their interpretation of Surah 3340, in which the Quran reads that, quote, um, the prophet is not the father of any of your men. And Sunnis would also go on to kind of reason that Allah didn't allow Muhammad's sons to live to their maturity because this wasn't what Allah intended that his sons, or that the leadership of the community was to be through the family. This is another reason why perhaps Muhammad did not nominate a successor, as he wanted to leave the succession to be resolved by the Ummah, the Muslim community, based on the Quranic principles of consultation. So this is how they answer that question. For Sunnis, the caliphate were only to have secular and political authority over an ever-growing Islamic community, but the caliphate was never to have religious authority. Instead, the religious authority was to be decentralized and localized to the individual community, again to the Ummah, as the Prophet had said in the Quran. My Ummah will not agree on an error. So let the community decide. And so this is where, where religious authority 
is to lie within the community. That is why there is no priest, there are no clerics within the tradition of Islam. It's not based on a rich lineage, but instead leadership is localized, localized to the community, and the community would appoint a man based on high characteristics and knowledge of the Quran and the Hadith. For Sunnism, this person is to be called an imam, I-M-A-M, or I-M-A-M, an imam, who may lead an Islamic community in worship services at a local mosque, lead them in prayer, serve as a community leader, and provide religious guidance. But it's, again, localized. As, again, the term imam gives their authority, one who stands in front of, stands in front of the community but the local community. Thus, for Sunnis, anyone can study the basic Islamic law and become an imam. It's not reserved to a select few or to the line of the prophet. In addition to the local leadership of the imam, and uh, 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 addition to this, uh, there was a guide that was provided to them. The Islamic community was to be guided religiously by God alone, and what God gave humanity was his sacred law, which in Islam is known as Sharia. Now, Sharia consists of maxims, of admonishments, legal sanctions, and prohibitions enshrined in the Quran, as well as elaborated by tradition. Uh, for all Muslims, Sharia is seen as, quote, a way to a source of water, end quote. Meaning that Sharia is seen as life and life itself. Very similar to how it's seen in Judaism. That Sharia was a way of living or a way of action. And so within Sharia, so it's not to be seen as this very oppressive thing, but a way to live one's life. So again, think halakha, Sharia law acts in a similar way. And there's five kinds of actions that govern a Muslim, according to Sharia. The first is halal, halal, which is things that are considered lawful and therefore obligatory for Muslims to do. So an example of Halal would be the five pillars. This is what Muslims are to do. The second would be mustahaba, uh, which is things that are considered commendable. Therefore, they're recommended that Muslims do. So an example of this would be Muslims are encouraged to pray more than just five times a day. That's the basic requirement five times a day. Muslims are encouraged to pray more than that. They're also encouraged to fast just not only during Ramadan, but to fast outside of Ramadan and to give beyond the 2.5% that is required of zakat. So again, it's things that are recommended. A Muslim doesn't have to do it to be a Muslim. The mustahabim is for them to be commended for doing. They should do these things. Uh, muba is those things that are neutral and thus permitted for a Muslim to do. So an example of this would be, uh, <laughs> let me think real quick, an example of this would be doing business with a non-Muslim. It's neutral. There's nothing saying within the Sharia for them, for a Muslim that can't do business with a non-Muslim. So they should. They can. They are okay with doing it. Um, uh, a good example is Ramadan. Ramadan, there's rules for Ramadan that if you're um, in a relationship with somebody, you're not supposed to have sex during the day of Ramadan. You're fasting from sex. But there's nothing from you having sex at night. So as soon as, soon as you know, it gets dark, you know, the pants can come off. It's permitted. Because again, it's not explicitly said. So those are some examples of Mubah. 
So there's also um, makruk, which is uh, things that are rehensible, therefore things that Muslims should avoid doing. So an example of this would be uh, married men um, shaving their beards. Beards are an indication of marriage. So if you're clean shaven, you're not married, therefore an eligible bachelor. But if you have a beard grown, you're no, you're you're taken off the table. Or uh, a, a thing a Muslim should avoid doing is disobeying their parents. Uh, another practical thing is uh, Muslims are to avoid receiving things, taking things with the left hand. So those are some things. Uh, the fifth thing is haram, and which means those things that are unlawful and therefore Muslims are forbidden to do. Examples would be adultery. That's a no-no. Drinking alcohol, major no-no. Smoking tobacco, major no-no. Eating pork, major no-no for Muslims. And like Judaism, Islam has a rich tradition of interpreting and explaining Sharia, especially as society changes in the face of modernity. And so these changes are known, uh, these explanations are known as fiqh, or Judas prudence. And so it's these theoretical or systematic aspects of Islamic law that consist of interpreting and codifying Sharia. So a person who specializes in, in interpreting Sharia is known in Islam as a jurist or a, a faqi. Islamic jurisprudence is based on four things, four sources for you to interpret Sharia law. You're first to consult the Quran, and if that doesn't help you, then you're to consult the Sunnas, the traditions about the Prophet. If that doesn't help you, then you're to rely on ishtahad, which is logical reasoning. And then if that doesn't help, the last thing is you bring it back to the community. What is the community always done? What is the community always uh, accepted? Which is ijma. So within Sunni Islam, there is a debate as to if good actions, ethics, and morality can exist outside an interpretation of the Quran. So it's really a debate between a literalist or a dynamic form of interpretation. Uh, but for Shia Muslims, the role of an imam is significantly different. And so that leads us to our last, or to our, our next group, where we talk about Shia Muslims. And so Shia are the next largest group, but they have a small size. Uh, Shiaism is the second largest branch of Islam, and it consists of around 10 to 15 percent of all Muslims in the world. Shia Muslims are primarily found uh, in the modern countries of Iran and Iraq and in Lebanon and the Gulf states of Bahrain as Azerbaijan and a small minority of Shia live in Pakistan, Kuwait and in Turkey. The word Shia comes from the Arabic word meaning Shia, and that the Arabic phrase Shia tu Ali means a follower of Ali. So they are the followers of Ali. The Shiites are, grouped, are, are a group of Muslims that believe Muhammad's son-in-law, Ali, is the true successor of the Prophet. In fact, when Ali assumed the caliphate in 656, he also took for himself religious authority, the authority to interpret the newly codified uh, Quran. Ali saw himself and declared himself as an imam for the whole Islamic community, and that he was divinely ordained as being a descendant of the prophet. In Shia context, an imam is not only presented as a man of God, par excellence, but as participating fully in the attributes and the acts and the theology reserved usually for God alone. So an imam in the Shia is very, very important. 
um, because of this belief about Ali and the Imams in Shiaism, Shia developed what are known as ancillaries of the faith, things that go beyond the five pillars, so they do more things. And so what are these, uh, these auxiliaries to the faith? Well, we already talked about one of them, and so I'm going to uh, mention it here again. Um, but Shia Muslims add a third clause the, to the Shahida. They add that phrase that Ali is the Wali or the custodian of God. And that this third clause here speaks to the added doctrine, which is very unique to that of Shiaism. Which leads me to the second point here. Imaha. The doctrine of Imaha. Which asserts that certain individuals from the lineage of the prophet are to be accepted as leaders and guides to the Ummah, the community, after the prophet's death. The doctrine of Imama further says that the Imams possess divine knowledge and divine authority as being a part of the Al Al Ba'at, the family of the Prophet, and that in their role of providing a commentary and interpretation of the Quran, as well as guiding the community secularly and politically. Shiites further believe that the Imams have the right to be caliphs, meaning that they are, that all other caliphs, whether elected by consensus of the community or not, are usurpers of the caliphate of the prophet, as those were political positions, not divine positions. Next, the uh, third thing is that because of the divine orientation upon and ordination uh, upon the imams and the family of the prophet, these imams' authority and interpretation is ishma, or infallible, without error. So that means, similar to like we talked about the pope and the papacy, meaning that they are, their teachings are without error. Their interpretations of the Quran are without error. And thus, they, their commands are to be absolute. They have the complete knowledge of God's will, and their knowledge encompasses the totality of everything. Thus, they are believed to act without fault in religious matters. So why they're respected. Uh, number four is that um, despite this belief concerning the imams and the prophet's family, there is division within Shiaism as to who are the true imams. And so according to Shiite tradition, the first imam of the Muslim community was in fact Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that the imamship passed successfully through the lineage of Ali until we get to the sixth imam, who's known as Jafar al-Sadiq, who dies around 65 BCE. And so when he died, the majority of Shia Muslims accepted that his youngest son, Musa, uh, as the seventh imam. However, a smaller but significant minority argued that the imamship should have passed to his eldest son of Jafar, Ishmael ibn uh, Jafar. The problem was that no one had seen Ishmael since the year 672, and therefore the community, the Shia community, presumed that Ishmael was dead. However, according to some Shia traditions, that since the age of seven, Ishmael was kept separate from his family because he was the next appointed heir and had already filled his father's absence in shoes when his father was ill. 
And because of political riots in the year 755, Jafar purposely hid his eldest son to protect him, and that Ishmael remained in hiding following his father's death because of these political riots and persecution. Um, but the eld- but it's, it's to be Ishmael's eldest son who is to be appointed the next in line not his brother. So it led to a division. And so these become known, those who accept this rendering are known as the Seveners. But that's only a small minority. Later on, the majority of Shia Muslims accept Musa's imamship and it continues until it's interrupted again by the 11th Imam, Hassan al-Askari, uh, who lived around the 800s uh, and who died in 874 uh, when he was assassinated by the Sunni Abbasids. But according to Shia tradition, the Hassan had an infant son named Muhammad, who was kept hidden from the public out of fear of Abbasid persecution and assassination. However, many Shiites claim that he had entered a state of, uh, of uh, occultation. So occultation, which basically means that he had disappeared. And so, so many Shiite Muslims believe that this 12th Imam will reappear, but when he reappears, he will be the Mahdi, and that when he comes, he will establish peace and justice. So the two groups of there's two groups of Shia, and there's two domino- denominations within Shia. So, like I said, there's the Seveners, and the largest group are the Twelvers, named after conflicts between who is the seventh and who is the twelfth Imam. But both groups of Shias believe in the doctrine of occultation. And so the doctrine of occultation is an eschatological belief concerning an impending messianic figure who is hidden and is the last imam, known as the Mahdi. They also believe that one day the Mahdi shall return on earth and fill the world with justice and that one of the main goals of the Mahdi will be establish an Islamic state and apply Sharia law as they were revealed to Muhammad. Uh, Now, number five. Many Shia Muslims believe that the holy relics and sacred items called taburik of all the prophets, including Muhammad, uh, were handed down in succession to the imams. And so they have certain levels of power and influence because claims of holy relics like a sword of Muhammad, things like that. So they do believe in holy relics. Uh, Six, Shia Muslims give an additional tax of charity called the kum which is given on top of the zakat. And so the kum is a religious tax of around 20%. So it's a, so thus Muslims are required, Shia Muslims are required to give 22.5% of their income to charity. And so the last thing that uh, Muslims also practice, Shia Muslims practice is, is that of uh, tabari, which is a re, uh, which refers to an obligation of disassociation with those who aren't believers in God, and also the doctrine of ta, uh, Tabari. Uh, um, um, uh, oh gosh, what I was trying to think. Where I was going to go with this. Oh yeah, yeah. So so, so in some communities of Shia Muslims. They also apply this doctrine to Muslims as well. So they would argue that because Sunni Muslims do not believe in uh, Ali as the first caliph, but 
declare Abu Bark as the first caliph, some Shia Muslims will see that they are not true believers in God. And so some Shia Muslims practice uh, Taribi with other Muslims and disown them and disassociate with them. So it led to further, further rifts between the two groups and some harsh decisions and, and disfeelings between these two groups. And Shia Muslims also practice um, jihad. Now, in a post 9 11 world, world uh, jihad is a very colored term that uh, we usually use it for terrorism and holy war, world war and Islamic terrorism. But however, the term jihad literally translates to struggle, to struggle. But a better translation is actually to strive. And so in Islamic context, jihad is a personal effort. It's a personal struggle, a personal strive that a Muslim takes to strive towards the path of God. And so Islamic, uh, Islamic traditions actually classifies jihad into various uh, two two main types of classifications an inner jihad that involves the struggle against your own um, sins and own impurities and, and own struggles and things like that for you to be uh, a good muslim but then it also talks about an external trust uh, 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 struggle an external jihad um, which can be divided as a jihad of a debate persuasion or a jihad of the sword, um, but we all know about the sword. So I won't go too much into that. But these are the two main groups of Islam. But however, I want to talk about there's some others, some other denominations of Islam real quick. So again, Sunni and Shia Islam represents the majority of Islamic tradition practices and beliefs but there are other known, less known religions uh, within Islam. And so for our purpose here, I want to briefly this, describe uh, three main other denominations of Islam. So you can see from this map, there's a lot many other denominations of Islam, but typically it just gets divided as Sunni versus Shia, but there are actually many more. But for our purpose here, I only want to talk about three, and they're all different. And their outtakes. So I want to talk about the Abadis, the Ahmadiyya, and the Quranism. They're Quranists, if I'd better say. So let's first talk about Abadi Islam or Abadiism. So Abadi Islam is a sect of Islam that originated in the early is excuse me in the early Islamic period as a moderate school of thought within the Khawarij movement that was during the first um, civil war within Islam. And the movement is named after Ab Ali, uh, uh, Ab Allah ibn Ibad, who died sometime around 700 CE. The Kahwari movement was a radical sect within Islam that emerged following the assassination of the third caliphate. Uh, the Kahwari were known for their extreme views on the issues of theology and politics and religious practices, like that only God is the true judge of a believer, uh, and that anyone who commits a major sin is automatically an unbeliever. And that the duty of Muslims are to fight and violently overthrow a, cor uh, a corrupted leader. Abadiism is a much moderate form of this, almost much liberal form of this ideology. But Abadiism is considered to be one of the oldest surviving branches of Islam that's not a part of the three, you know, the two traditional mainstream forms of uh, Islam, Sunni and Shia. Abadiism is primarily practiced in the modern-day country of Oman, where it's the dominant sect of Islam. 
Uh, but it's also found in other parts of the Islamic world, particularly in Northern Africa and East Africa, but in very small numbers. So it's maybe 1%, if not less than 1% of all Muslims are a body. Uh, a, a bodyism, uh, its emergence can be traced back to uh, uh, religious turmoils within the Muslim community. So again, that first civil war, where the first civil war basically led to the establishment of Sunni and Shia Muslims, the Abadis were a reaction. The Abadis emerged out of dissatisfaction with the political establishment and the religious structures that had started to emerge within the world. They rejected both claims of Sunni and Shia Muslims for the leaderships. Instead, Abadis believed that the concept of Khilafa, Khilafa, which refers to represental government. Abadis believe that the leaders of a Muslim community is to be chosen by consensus of the entire community, not just a select few, and is not to be chosen based off lineage of from the prophet. But a consensus of the entire community and that the, the leader of the Muslim community should be governing the community according to justice, equality, and fairness. They believed that the Prophet had established this type of system of consultation and consensus through his constitution of Medina and that it needed to be practiced and it wasn't being practiced. Uh, in addition to these kind of political beliefs, Abadiism is also characterized by a strong impetus on social justice and egalitarianism. Uh, the Abadis uh, believe that all people are equal before God and that no one should be treated with respect without, or everybody should be treated with respect and fairness regardless of their background, their race, or social status. They also place a strong emphasis on the importance of helping the needy and promoting social welfare. And Abadis believe that women have equal rights and opportunity as men in all things, even in the field of religion, so which makes them a little bit different. And finally, uh, the Abadi uh, is different than Sunni and Shia because it has a different view on Hadiths, and that's the main differences. While they accept the authenticity of many of the same Hadith collections within Sunni and Shia Islam, they place less emphasis on Hadith as being a source of religious authority. Instead, they argue that the only authority within the, the Islamic community is the Quran and the consensus of the community, as how the Prophet taught. So it makes them quite different in that they, they, even though they have a Hadith tradition, their Hadith tradition is much different than Sunni and Shia, and they don't really rely on it. It's more storytelling and part of their history. So it makes them different. Our next group, as you can see here, is not really on the map. They are the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And so the reason I want to bring this up, because they're in fact one of the largest growing Islamic groups that are out there, but they're not considered Muslim. And I'll tell you why. So they're a religious movement within Islam that was founded by an Indian, an Indian man named Mirza Amid, or Ahmad, sorry, Ahmad, not Ahmad, Amid, Ahmad. Uh, in the 19th century, yeah. Uh, the movement is based on his teachings and interpretation of Islam, so that's why they're named after him. Um, they're a very small community, but extremely influential and a growing community. The Ahmadiyya, a Muslim community, has faced significant persecution by overwhelming majority Muslims who do not see them as Muslims and that they hold different beliefs. So what are their beliefs? Well, it's three things. One, which is the most significant, the uh, 
Hamayid have a different belief about the prophethood of Muhammad. This Muslim community believes that the founder of their movement, Mirza Ahmad, is the Mahdi. He is the promised Messiah within Islam, and he was the promised Messiah to come after the, after the prophet. And so this is why they emerge, that they believe he was the prophet, or he was uh, the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the Mahdi, and so the majority of Muslims reject this belief. They consider it a huge departure from mainstream belief. And so they reject his claim and reject his idea that he's a prophet in the same vein as Muhammad. Instead, Muhammad is the last of the prophets. So that's why they are rejected. Uh, another belief is about the role of Islamic law the Ahmadid uh, places a greater emphasis on individual consensus and rationalism in light of interpretation. So again, they don't have hadiths. They don't have they don't have any hadiths. So they place it on the community, the community of them and their interpretation. So which is something that is different too. But also what makes them different is their attitude towards other faiths. The Ahmadid uh, uh, is known for its commitment to promoting peace and tolerance and interfaith dialogues with other faiths. And so even though Shia Muslims value interfaith dialogues, the Ahmadid are more vocal about it. And um, practice it more um, out in the open, I guess, if I could say that, more readily than anything. The last group that I want to talk about is the Quranists, or Quranism, which this is a relatively new movement that has always existed, but has started to grow in fame since the 19th century, and particularly in the 20th century, um, um, as well, in, in, in large part, into Western societies and in Africa as well. So, the Quranism is a movement within Islam that rejects the authority of the Hadiths and the Sunnas and considers the Quran to be the only source of authentic Islamic teaching and guidance. So, they reject the Hadiths, they reject the traditions around the prophets. Quranists believe that the Quran is complete and self-sufficient. That's all they need. And it provides all the guidance that a Muslim needs. There doesn't need to be any of these traditions. They argue that the Hadiths, while valuable and contain historical and cultural information, are in fact fallible and have human error. And they have been subject to manipulation and corruption over time, so thus need to be rejected. As a result, Quranists reject many traditional practices of mainstream Islam. They include an emphasis that, I mean, so this might be an emphasis on how many times you need to pray. The importance of, of Sharia law in your life, the Quran, many of the Quranists, would disagree. And so they don't pray five times a day. They might not practice everything within Sharia because if it's not mentioned in the Quran, it's not important. But Quranism is not a monolithic movement, so it, adherence to certain doctrines range very wide and broad because, again, of these practices. Um, but the history of Quranicism can be traced back to the very earliest centuries. So I mean, you can go back all the way to um, um, ninth century Spain um, with Ibn Hazam, who was the first Muslim to argue that the Quran is the only authoritative source within Islam. But really, it's the 19th and 20th century and where the Quranist movement began to emerge, particularly with the writings of the Indian scholar. Uh, Ahmed Parwaz and the Egyptian scholar Muhammad Sadiq. So it's very well. But 
Quranism is not widely recognized or established movement within Islam, uh, but it has attracted a huge, huge recent following among Muslims who have started to grow dissatisfied with the traditions and within the squabbles between Sunni and Shi'i and who seek to have a more direct personal relationship with uh, Allah and with the Quran. So those are just some examples of other denominations of Islam that are out there. Our last bit of discussion that I want to talk about is Sufism. So like all Abrahamic religions, all of them have a certain segment of their religious population which seeks a higher level of spirituality and religiosity. Um, if you recall, mysticism is a practice, uh, religious practice, which helps to helps protect, uh, practitioners become one with God or the absolute through any kind of, of altered state of consciousness or ecstasy. And it may also refer to the attainment of some type of incitement, incite, uh, uh, yeah, enlightenment. Um, or insight into hidden truth. Um, and sometimes it can talk about human transformation as well. Um, the roots of mysticism go all the way back to ancient Greeks, uh, to Greece with the um, with Plato and Neoplatonism as well. Um, but really the heart of it on the er uh, er uh, Abrahamic side is really with Kabbalah. And Sufism fits within that tradition. And so what is Sufism? Sufism is known is also known as Tasawwuf, is a mystical form of Islam found mainly within Sunni traditions, but it's also there in Shia. Uh, and it's characterized by a focus on Islamic spirituality, uh, ritualization, asceticism, and esotericism. Um, Sufism emerged as a reaction, uh, and really a reactionary movement against the political instabilities and, and infighting and worldliness of the Umayyad and Abbasid periods, um, where many people thought that the religious uh, tone and nature of the, of the Islamic community was suffering and degrading. According to tradition, Sufism started with the, with the preachings of Hassan al-Basari, uh, who exists, you know, who lived in 642 and died in 728 BCE, uh, who, while on a military incursion in, a, in, a, in Iraq, uh, uh, witnessed Muslims' mistreatment of native populations and saw the vast amount of wealth that was being occurred by the Islamic community and saw this was all a, a, a break from the teachings of Muhammad. Uh, he was also influenced by Armenian Christians uh, who practiced a form of asceticism as well. Um, Al-Basari uh, advocated for ascetic practices and he helped that it would believe, he believed that it helped prepare for the day of judgment to come faster. Uh, Sufism uh, as a word uh, comes from the Arabic meaning uh, one who wears sheep wool and which was a very common epithet for aesthetic monks in Ar Arabic cultures. Um, while existing in both Sunni and Shia Islam, Sufism is not to be seen as a distinct sect or denomination of Islam, as it is sometimes erroneously assumed. Instead, many Muslims just see Sufism as a part and parcel of what they're doing. They see it as being the truest form, the truest denomination of Islam. That some academics and historians argue that Sufism should be treated as something separate because of those types of feelings and sayings, but in truth, um, no, it's not. It's more just a different way of interpreting and doing the practices of Islam. Sufism is considered a part of Islamic teachings that deal with 
the purification of the inner self. So we're talking about here the inner jihad. And that's what it smokes, this seems to be mostly focusing on. By focusing on the more spiritual aspects of religion, Sufism strives to obtain direct experiences with God by making use of intuition and emotional fa uh, faculties that one must be trained to use. Both in Shia and Sunni Islam, there's a deep recognition that God is so holy and too perfect that a Muslim will never see or experience God, even at the point of death or even at judgment day, because God is so deeply different than humans. He's so above humans that a human will never actually see God. For Sufis, they believe that, that actually seeing God and experiencing God is possible and achievable for a Muslim and even achievable in this life, that you don't have to wait until heaven to see God. So thus, the chief aim of all Sufis is to seek the pleasing of God by working to restore within themselves this primordial state of fitrah, which fitrah is known as a state of purity and innocent in which Muslims believed all humans were born into. Sufis describe fitrah as, quote, an innate nature of any Muslim, the original deposition of humanity. Sufis believe that all of this is possible, that we can go back to our original state of purity through the assistance of a teacher or a Sufi master called a, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, called a um, Pir, P-I-R, or a um, Sheik, yes, a Sheik who serves as a transmitter of secret wisdom from the prophet himself. And so part of this secret wisdom that Sufis believe in is the doctrine of al-insan al-kamali, or the doctrine of the perfect man. The doctrine of the perfect man states that there will always be and always will exist upon the earth a kut, a kutib, the perfect man, who is perfect channel of grace from God to man, and who's in a state of of wilala, of of we lala, or under the protection of Allah from sin, and that these perfect men are like prophets who exist in order to teach Muslims the way to direct experiences with gods with God, not gods, but God. All Sufis believe that there is an unbroken chain of teaching that goes all the way back to the Prophet himself and reaches the highest level of success in Sufism. So this is why they seek out a Sufi master and that he is allowing these lines of teachings. So Sufis believe that by giving allegiance or bayah to a legitimate Sufi master, one is also seamlessly pledging themselves to the Prophet. And therefore, a spiritual connection between the seeker and the Prophet is established through the Sufi master. And it's through the Prophet that Sufis aim to learn about and understand and connect with God. And within Sufi Islam, Ali is also regarded as a major figure amongst many of the companions. So sometimes having direct allegiance to the Prophet, Sufis maintain that through Ali as well, they can have knowledge about the Prophet and connect. So, so these are the Sufi Shia Muslims that will bring that element to their practices. Uh, Sufi practitioners have held that Sufism is strict emulation of the way of Muhammad and that which the heart connects to the divine. Devotion 
the devotional practices of Sufism can um, uh, vary widely. However, there are prerequisites to Sufi practices, which are adherences to the five pillars. The seeker must also, of necessity, turn away from sin, uh, turn away from love of this world, turn away from love of company, uh, um, turn away from satanic impulses, and, um, and they must be trained to prevent corruption of good deeds. And Sufi practices are not the cause of knowledge, but instead are the occasions for knowledge to come and to be attained. So they see it as channeling. So to end with, I want to talk about the two most common Sufi practices that are very important for beliefs. And that is Dekur and Murakaba. So Dekur comes from the Arabic word meaning remembrance. And it is a form of Islamic meditation in which phrases or prayers are repeated chantedly in order to remember God and to practice consciousness on the divine. So it's very similar to what we talked about within Sikhism of meditating on the divine name. It's quite similar. The Kirk can be performed in absolute solitude or as a collective group. And if it's performed as a collective group, the Kirk is usually incorporated with ritualized ceremonies called Shimas that include uh, singing, uh, recitation, music, or dancing. And so that's the really the most common form of the Kirk that you see. As you can see in the images, and you might know that the, the famous whirling dervishes are actually the most prominent common form of the Kirk. The purpose of the whirling dervishes is to abandon one's egos and desires by focusing on God's love while spinning. So as a form of meditation that you give up yourself, focus on the spinning that you can start concentrating on other things. Murakaba is a standard form of meditation aimed at refraining from any actions contrary to the obligatory and ultimately maintains one's mindfulness in a state that God finds it. So where you can be pleasing to God. So you meditate on love. You meditate on music. You meditate on poetry to create a better kind of consciousness for what God is to reside in. And so at, uh, at, at an end, this is Sufi Islam.